Hello? Okay. Good morning. If you could all find your seats, we'll start here in just a moment. Okay, well, good morning. It's good to see you all. It's, uh, thank you. Uh, it's such an honor and delight to uh, be able to host this event. I'm Greg Johnson, director of the Walter H. Cap uh, Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life here at UCSB. Um, Today is going to be a great day. I'll have an, a chance to address you at greater length later, so I'll keep it short now. Um, it's such an honor to be able to kick off uh, the day's events and to welcome to this stage my friend and colleague uh, Kathleen Moore, who's the Associate Dean of Humanities and Fine Arts here at UCSB and also Professor of Religious Studies and a colleague I've learned so much from about law, religion, and also about collegial citizenship. So thank you, Kathy, for doing this for us. Welcome, Kathy Moore. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited and honored to be um, part of this conversation this morning and uh, kick off the day's events. And as Professor Johnson mentioned, I'm Kathleen Moore, Associate Dean of Humanities and Fine Arts, and I am in the Religious Studies Department. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, was never able to meet Walter Capps, but as Greg said yesterday, and many of the participants attested to, uh, Walter Capps left a gigantic and indelible footprint in our field. So it's wonderful to be here to commemorate uh, the course that Walter Capps taught in this very auditorium uh, where so many events are, take place. But this is one that is historic. I've heard many stories about Walter Capps' gifted teaching, and I can tell you that I think no one, no one has addressed our students, asked our students, to uh, think deeply about the challenges that are facing our country, and no one has prepared them better to reckon with these issues than Walter Capps did. So I'm very happy that you've decided to join us this morning for Remembering the Vietnam War class. This is a panel on Walter Capps' famous course on the Vietnam War and its impacts featuring former instructors and guest speakers for the course. My role today is, and I'm honored to introduce a good colleague and friend uh, who is going to moderate, be the first speaker in the panel and moderate the panel, and this is Richard Hecht, who is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Religious Studies at UCSB, where he joined the faculty in the 1970s and taught until his retirement two years ago. Uh, Richard is uh, here with us virtually and not able to join us in flesh. I believe Richard's in Europe somewhere. He would let us know. But Richard served uh, until very recently as the director of the UCSB Taubman Endowed Symposia. And his interests are diverse and multidisciplinary in the deep contextualization of religion and the intersection of religion, politics, and culture. After Walter Capps ran for Congress in 1994, Hecht taught the Vietnam War course until it ended in 2018, and I can think of no one better uh, to do that. As chair of the Department of Religious Studies from 1995 to 1999, when Clark Roof assumed that position, Professor Hecht was involved with the planning of the Walter H. Capps Center, as we heard from EBC David Marshall yesterday. 
So without any further ado, I'd like to turn this over to my friend and colleague, Richard Hecht. Welcome. Thank you very much, Kathy. I hope people can hear me. Um, it's a great honor uh, to share the stage with uh, Governor and Senator uh, Bob Carey um, and also Shad Bishad, who both were instrumental in the first decade of this extraordinary class. Um, what I'd like to do now, very, very briefly, is have our colleagues in the back put up a small or a short uh, slide um, series um, that I'd like to share with you that will give you an idea of some of the characters I'll be speaking about later. Could I have the slide um, show at the present time? So it's wonderful that we can have this event. I'm sure Greg and uh, the others calculated this perfectly that we could have this discussion on Veterans Day uh, to market. So can I have the first slide? So this is a photograph that I'm sending really to several of my uh, colleagues um, who I think have spoken to you yesterday. And I say that I send you my regrets for not being able to be in Santa Barbara um, to greet you and say hello and remember the past um, with you. But um, we have put together a conference to mark the uh, 10th anniversary of Walter's death. And I took this photograph of um, the people who spoke at that conference. So I'd like to introduce them to you. You've met them, but they were a bit younger then. Um, so way over on the left is Robert Orsi, who was one of the main speakers, Professor Orsi. And then we have um, Professor Tomoko Masuzawa and um, um, uh, Professor Wendy Wright, uh, and then next to her, David Chittister from South Africa, and then one of the great uh, scholars in the study of religion who began his career at UCSB and became very, very friendly with the Capps family, Jonathan Z. Smith, who passed away on December 31st, 2017. And there, of course, is um, uh, Congresswoman uh, Lois Capps, and then next to her is Sarah McFarland Taylor. And then in the back, Ed Linenthal. Um, and then finally, uh, Roger Friedland. And then uh, the first director of the CAP Center, uh, our beloved uh, Clark Roof. Next slide, please. So um, to mark the 25th anniversary of the class, many of the speakers who had come to the class um, um, we decided that we would have an event where we'd take about 50 students or so to Washington, D.C. And uh, Lois arranged for us to receive a congressional um, uh, plaque. And here are all the people who have been uh, uh, instrumental in the class. And the slide is a little, little uh, small for me to see, but I'll try to remember everyone. So way over on the left is... Um, Jim Nolan, next to him is Mike Madrid, then I believe um, um, Malcolm Hamilton, and next to Malcolm Hamilton is John Moore, and there is Congresswoman Lois Capps, and then next to her is Shad Mishad, then um, Bill Mahidi, Reverend Bill Mahidi, and then uh, Jack Wheeler, and then finally Wilson Hubble. Um, and then we met uh, for this uh, photograph and a bit of a ceremony at the tree that Congress planted in, on in honor of Walter. Um, it's now a, a much larger tree, but you can see it's something like a, uh, a sapling. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, here is a typical adventure during February uh, of Religious Studies 155, where we took a group of students um, to Washington, D.C., um, and we visited many places, such as the Veterans Administration, um, the State Department. Uh, of course, we visited the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, um, the um, Smithsonian Museum, um, 
uh, Arlington National Cemetery, et cetera. And here are, are many of the people um, um, with the students who participated in the class um, for several years. Now I'd like to end the slide pre presentation and talk to you about the class. Um, the um, um, uh, uh, organizers of the conference uh, asked me to give you a brief overview of the class, um, although I assume that some of you um, are very, very familiar and spent many um, uh, days on Tuesday and Thursday in the months of January, February, and early March uh, in uh, the classroom, either here in Campbell Hall or in another auditorium. But the way what we'll do today is I'm going to speak very briefly, and then I'll introduce uh, our distinguished uh, guests, uh, Governor and uh, Senator Bob Carey, and then, of course, Shad Mishad. Each of them will speak for about 15 minutes. Then we'll have a bit of a discussion amongst ourselves, and then we'll, I hope, have enough time for one or two questions uh, from um, uh, the audience. I must tell you, that in um, 1995, when Walter asked me to take the course from him, I was really intimidated. The course had already been the subject of two 60-minute segments. I found seven articles on the class in national uh, journals, um, and I was really intimidated. And I remember what Walter told me. He said, there's nothing to worry about. The veterans will support you, and they did. And then Wilson Hubble, who worked with Walter, I believe, since 1979 in the class, uh, will support you, and Wilson did. And Wilson and I uh, taught the course together for the first decade after Walter's death, and we were joined by Jim Nolan, a Marine veteran who received three Purple Hearts um, and the three of us offered the course as co-instructors every winter quarter until 2018. We agreed that we would continue to offer the course as long as all three of us were able to do it. When the cancer that Jim had contracted as a result of Agent Orange defoliant made it impossible for him to con continue, the three of us made the decision to end the course together. The UCSB Alumni Magazine, Coastlines, featured the end of the course um, in uh, 2018 in the uh, spring issue uh, of Coastlines. Now, among the many veterans who spoke in the course were veterans whose stories were so powerful that you could sit there in Campbell Hall as you are and you could hear the breathing and even the heartbeat of students and others sitting around you. And literally many men and women um, wept um, during the presentations. I remember Rose Sendecki, for example, a combat nurse uh, who, when she came back to California after her service, um, was unable to use any of the techniques that she had saved lives with in uh, emergency hospitals because she wasn't a doctor. I remember Tony Cordero, whose father was uh, an Air Force major um, in a uh, navigator in a B-57 that was shot down over North Vietnam. Uh, he was the first uh, soldier uh, from Santa Barbara to be killed during the Vietnam War. And in 1989, Tony uh, formed something called Sons and Daughters uh, in Touch, which was an effort to bring together the children and grandchildren of Gold Star families. And Tony would come to the class and each year would tell us uh, about the search for the remains of his father uh, in North Vietnam. I remember Michael Moore, um, who was born and grew up in Santa Barbara, uh, became a, um, uh, a soldier in the Vietnam War, suffered extraordinary um, PTSD, who became a championship poker player 
And I believe in uh, 2013, he won the World Series of Poker in Las Vegas and made almost a quarter, uh, half a million dollar, uh, dollars as a poker player. Um, he passed away shortly after becoming a very successful uh, landscape painter influenced by the work of Georgia O'Keeffe in South Dakota. There are two individuals who need to be mentioned today with regard to the course, Eula Lauchs and Roger Himovitz. Eula Lauchs entered the graduate program in religious studies at the age of 69 and completed her PhD dissertation on the subject of the meaning of children in contemporary America with Walter and was a lifelong supporter of many of Walter's courses and his research. Roger Himovitz took the Vietnam course when he returned to the university and ultimately was one of the teaching assistants who worked with the undergraduate students who enrolled in the course. Likewise, Roger helped provide uh, scholarships for students who wanted to go with us um, to uh, Washington in the month of uh, late February uh, each year. Um, now, um, the class always ended with two special presentations, one by Dr. Sharon Rapp, um, who worked with the Veterans Administration as a therapist and had almost all of the veterans who spoke in a weekly group session. She told the students what we had actually experienced. We were part of the therapy of those veterans, all of whom suffered from relative um, uh, extreme cases of uh, uh, post-traumatic stress. The penultimate class uh, was a meeting with Wilson Hubble, and I have to tell you about it. Um, Wilson grew up in San Diego, was a long-distance bicyclist, and I mean a really long-distance bicyclist. He would um, bicycle uh, across the United States several times. He bicycled around Mexico, in Europe. Um, and one day he was reading his, one of his bicycle magazines. He saw an advertisement for Cycle Vietnam. It was, an, it was a, a, a bicycle trip that would take him from Hanoi to Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City, 1,700 kilometers. And Wilson ultimately did it. And he would take the students uh, along that 1,700-kilometer uh, uh, bike trip with the students. At one point, he found his way to one of the beaches near the base that he served in. And as he told the students, uh, he was looking at the sand dunes and the water that he remembered. Uh, a young Vietnamese man came up to him wearing bathing trunks. And w Wilson, who remembered a bit of his uh, Vietnamese, said to him, Toi Mai, I'm an American, American. He pointed back to the area of Quinon. I was in army over there. I'm from California, Santa Barbara, California. The young Vietnamese man looked at him uh, for a moment with a smirk and in perfect English said, no shit, like I was so dumb. I'm Frank from Tustin. Um, now, um, at one point, Wilson made it to the base where he had been stationed. And in that base, um, he confronted uh, a uh, Vietnamese soldier who had been in the Viet Cong when Wilson was in that base. And they became friends. And at the end, this Vietnamese um, uh, soldier, an officer, gave Wilson a picture of himself in his North Vietnamese army uniform. And he wrote on the back a well-known Vietnamese epigram using um, uh, use among friends. Quote, the wind will erase the words on the tombstone, but friendship will never end. Wilson gave, Wilson gave him a soldier, a soldier badge from his battalion. The return to Vietnam, the chance meetings with a Vietnamese American in Viet Vietnam, and his adversary three decades before changed the meaning of Vietnam for him. His last slide was a photo taken from his airplane 
as it left Vietnam with the rice paddies shimmering in the reflected sunlight. And Wilson said, Vietnam was no longer a war. Vietnam is a place. Now let me introduce to you our speakers. First of all, um, Bob Carey, who has decades of public service and healthcare experience uh, serving vulnerable populations. He served as governor of Nebraska from 1983 to 1987, and as a United States Senator from Nebraska from 1989 to 2001. He is also a veteran of the Vietnam War where he served as a U.S. Navy SEAL officer, and in 1970 was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. He served as president of the New School University from 2001 to 2010, and then emeritus president of the New School University until 2013. During his presidency, the New School evolved into a major degree granting urban university widely recognized for its emphasis on design in a social context. Kerry is credited with doubling the size of the full-time faculty and securing the new school's future by raising more than $110 million to advance uh, dollars to advance the key academic and administrative objectives. Throughout his career, he has demonstrated a commitment to support other veterans and their access to health care. He was also a co-instructor with Walter in the uh, early decade of the class. Please welcome Senator and Governor Bob Kerry. Um, that's a really good question. I have a choice to make. Wow, wow a choice. I think I'll sit. Uh, it's nice having the Wizard of Oz behind me. <laughs> um, so, uh, first, uh, first of all, I, I came here because of the Caps, uh, Lois and Laura, and, uh, I've gotten fortunately very close to the Caps family, and um, it was, and still is, it's great to both be with you and tell you stories and have you tell me stories and so forth. So, uh, I think Walter would not object. Do you, is, it, is it too informal to put my arm over this chair? <laughs> if it is, you're out of luck, because I'm, so, uh, I don't think he'd be offended by it, but you know he, he's not here to be mad at me. In fact, I don't think he ever got mad at me for anything. So, um, uh, I, I am, um, I believe, accurately described as a plankton. Um, and if you don't know plankton, um, uh, maybe there's more plankton on Earth than any other species out there. But um, plankton is defined by its motility. Uh, that's that's how you tell a, a plankton. Plankton. Uh, cannot move on their own. They just go with the wind, they blow with the ocean currents, that's how they move about. And that pretty much describes me. So um, uh, everything on the list of things that I've done, I knew almost nothing about when I started, including uh, co-teaching a class uh, with Walter. It was a, a, a difficult choice for me. I was 43 years old, I just stepped down as governor, and Walter gave me an opportunity, uh, uh, it could be framed this way, I could either stay in Omaha, Nebraska for January, February, and March, uh, or I could come out to Santa Barbara for January, February, and March. And the last month, it was only, it was only here a quarter, and uh, the senior Democratic senator in Nebraska died in office. Um, one of the great things I ever heard anybody say about a recently deceased person was a very good friend of his, he called me and said, uh, Ed's died. And I was the first one to come upon his body. And you know, Bob, he never looked better. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so uh, I'm, I'm relatively confident that I would not have run for governor, I've run for senator, uh, were it not for Walter in this class. Um, now, but the, the person who followed me as governor is a Republican, and she appointed, uh, obviously, a Republican to be uh, her successor. And, um, you know, at the funeral, they were urging me to run, and they were in the, I, I, I ran in spite of the fact that I watched them in the back room arguing about who's going to get uh, Ed Zerinsky's office, who's going to get his committee. <laughs> it was a really uh, unpleasant scene. Uh, and I, I, I would not have run for Senate. And, um, I did it for two terms. Walter, 
um, was, was really a fun person to talk to because there was almost nothing he couldn't talk about. And he didn't uh, feel like it was inappropriate to bounce around from topic to topic, which is, as I self-describe myself, that, that's who I am. And when I, as I was trying to think, well, what am I going to say to all of you other than congratulations to the young people who showed up on Saturday, Saturday morning, um, I, I genuinely do uh, congratulate you. I doubt I would have done the same as you uh, when I was your age. Um, so the, I just mentioned uh, uh, three books that are, I, for me at least, relevant to this conversation. Uh, the first is Jane Hamilton's book, The Second Law of Thermodynamics. Uh, second is uh, Charles Baxter's book, uh, Relative Stranger. And the, uh, the last is um, Foreseeable Future by Reynolds Price. Uh, and the first, what Hamilton asserts, is that everything changes depending on where you stand and where you are. It just, it does. The world looks different. Uh, to me today than it did in 1987. It looks different than it did yesterday. So um, not only should you not be appalled by that, it should be a source of not necessarily inspiration, but a source of discovery, which uh, on my mind is uh, perhaps the uh, most important things that human beings can do. Um, last night at dinner, there was a young woman there who um, had, actually took Walter's class later on in her life, but uh, she's, I think, I, I, can't, I was about to say how old I think she is, which is, I guess, not something that I should do. So um, uh, she worked on Walter's campaign, uh, raising money, his second campaign, I believe. Um, and so I want to ask her her story. She came to the United States from Vietnam when she was two years old in 1975. I said, well, how about your, your parents? My mom came with me. My, my dad was a South Vietnamese pilot. Uh, and he was held prisoner by the North Vietnamese for 15 more years before he uh, was allowed to come to the United States, probably only allowed because the Soviet Union collapsed the year that he was allowed to come back, uh, come to the United States and join his family. Now, I'm willing to assert that if I had been a friend of her father's doing the same thing, in the 1970s, as he was doing, I might have a much different view of the Vietnam War than based upon my limited experience. Uh, it's just true. Uh, I, uh, among the things I, I wish Walter was alive to uh, hear about is uh, when we normalized relations with Vietnam in, 19, uh, in 1995. Uh, it was a big moment for me because uh, we had worked to get the roadmap written with former President uh, Bush, Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, that involved, you know, the POW, MIA issue. We had to resolve that. We had to get a peace agreement with Cambodia. We didn't have diplomatic relations with Vietnam, so we couldn't negotiate directly with this. It was complicated, confusing. Bush wrote the road, uh, roadmap, and then he loses. And uh, he lost to a guy who famously did not go to Vietnam. And Bill Clinton bravely, am I, is my voice starting to get quieter and quieter as I move my, this microphone away? So... Bill Clinton signed the normalization legislation in 1995. We sent a former POW, Pete Peterson, back there as our first ambassador. Uh, unbeknownst to the president, um, uh, uh, I basically stole $150 million that was supposed to go from Vietnam to the United States and ended up going uh, to create a, a college in uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Fulbright University of Vietnam. And we've graduated over 1,000 graduate students. We started an undergraduate program a couple of years ago. Uh, the current head of the Communist Party's son goes to that school. And when I ask him, because he, uh, when he was born, he said he was born in 61, excuse me, yeah, 61, uh, meaning, uh, uh, I said, were you, were you in Hanoi for the Christmas bombing of 1972? Oh, yes. He said, I snuck out. It was very exciting. I saw B-52s uh, being shot down. Um, and he, he tells his story as if he was talking about going to a movie uh, the, the previous day. We, we killed 1,700 people on the Christmas bombing as, a, as an effort by Richard Nixon, who just won a landslide re-election, um, to try to get the North Vietnamese to come back to the negotiating table, which they did, uh, and they actually ended up getting more than they would have uh, had it not been for the Christmas bombing. Anyway, you can, you can get wrapped up in the, the, the horror of that, the terror of that, the hypocrisy of that, the ugliness of that, or you can lash up with the, you know, the chairman of the Communist Party in Vietnam and help him try to build his country, which is the choice that uh, you know, I make. 
So Reynolds Price wrote uh, his book, The Foreseeable Future. Anyway, Jane um, Hamilton's book is quite good about the theory. It's a little obscene, so I won't go into it. Um, but Reynolds uh, had a star-shaped uh, uh, carcinoma on his spine, and he had to have it cut out. And I don't know if they do that today, but they did it. And they said, there's a possibility that you're going to get, you know, you're going to be paralyzed when this is over. And he wasn't, so he's very happy. Walk into class at Duke uh, one day. He said, it's like a light switch went on and my legs gave out. So he's paralyzed. So he writes this book uh, called The Foreseeable Future about a guy who comes back from the Second World, had been on D-Day, uh, and he tells his wife, the man who went to the Second World War is dead. Well, you're standing right in front, no. The man who went there died uh, in France. Um, well, that uh, set her off a little bit, but he, he brings himself back to life. He, he ends up getting a job as a, as a property and casualty adjuster, the guy that goes out to an accident and you know, says, oh yeah, you, you, we owe you $5,000 or whatever. So he, he went to disasters, places where people had suffered a terrible loss. And he calculated, his, his job was to calculate how much do we owe you for this loss. That's what he did. And a, it was a, the story goes on for a week. It's a relatively short story. It goes on, and when he's done with that week, at each one of these stops, there's been something added back. So when he arrives back home after that week, after having experienced in, in, uh, uh, all these losses, uh, he was alive again. Uh, he was no longer dead. Uh, and the uh, last one, I don't need to go into detail, because I have a feeling, but even without uh, uh, looking at my watch, I may have gone a little over my time. Uh, the, the, the other one's called Relative Stranger, and it's Charles Baxter. And what I like about Charles Baxter's uh, idea is don't walk away from the stranger, uh, because you're much more apt to learn something from the stranger, because obviously you didn't know anything about him or her uh, from, in the first place. All you've got is people that you know. You only know them. You know, why waste your time on Chad? Why do I, you know, I wander around in the audience to get to know somebody. But all three of these, to my mind, uh, in some way unite the whole idea of trying to understand Vietnam. Vietnam is different. This is the, uh, you know, the 11th of November, obviously. And the 11th of November, uh, 1918, uh, the powers that be decided. I mean, it's, it's a horror to think about, you know, four or five old white men sitting around saying, well, when do we want to end it? Uh, we, how about the 11th of November? How about 11 o'clock in the morning on the 11th of November? So you guys can keep shooting up until then. You can keep killing up until then, and afterwards it's over. And my, my, I just try to imagine what it must have been like to come back after that horror and try to adjust, try to understand what it's all about. And all the opportunities, of all the opportunities that we've missed over the course of our nation's short, happy life, um, maybe the at the end of the Second, First World War, uh, we missed many that had a huge impact, including Ho Chi Minh was there trying to get recognized, including the Arabs trying to get recognized. Neither of those happened uh, because we didn't see what good could come out of it if we did. All this is to say, if, for, my, for my money, if I, if I get trapped uh, in feeling sorry for myself because something terrible happened to me or somebody said something terrible to, to me or some other experience, uh, and all hope is lost. I cannot, I cannot survive uh, cynicism. Uh, I, I live on skepticism. Um, and, but cynicism to me, I, I don't want to touch it. And cynicism is what happens oftentimes to old people, and if you haven't recognized this, I am old. Uh, I said earlier that when I'm trying to impress upon my children how old I am, I simply say, you young people get, re get, get ready for this, I was born before Google. That's who I am. All right, so uh, uh, the, the worst thing I can do is to become cynical. And, it's the, the, and that's a short voyage from skeptic to a cynic. Skeptic says, prove the facts. The cynic says, I don't believe human beings are capable of doing good. And it's a, it becomes, in the, in, the, in the mouth of an old person, it becomes a virus that is intentionally delivered to infect young people. So beware the old cynic. That's my advice to those of you like five rows back. So, okay, I'm done. Chad, you ready? Uh, am I ready? First of all, uh, it's 
a very different sitting on this stage, <laughs> you know. I stood for almost 20 straight years with Walter doing the class or whatever, but uh, it, this is sacred ground. I think of all the vets and people from Russian soldiers to Vietnamese uh, children and uh, uh, the thousands of kids. I, I think the big moment was at Walter's funeral and certain of us were allowed in the, in the mission church, but outside there were like 4,000 students that had went through the class and when I heard them yelling my name, I had to run out and embrace as many as I could because that's, that's what it was about. Uh, I think we're supposed to start with the slide. I'm uh, supposed to ask the uh, Avery to kick off the... Is it good? Okay. I don't think there's any sound. And strong, but I'm excited. I'm excited because really the person who introduced me to the Vietnam War topic in a way that became accessible for this campus is our guest today. And he has spoken to this class over the years more frequently than anybody else. He was the, the first vet to speak to the class when the class was organized back in 1979. We figured um, coming in here this morning that um, when he and I were up here doing this, uh, some of you were probably about five or six or seven years old. So we've, we've been at this for some time. His name is Shad Meshad. Shad Meshad, you spell the last name M-E-S-H-A-D. And you spell the first name um, S-H-A-D. You leave off the, the M-E um, first time through. It's, it's Shad Meshad. Uh, <clears throat> Shad, Shad and I, um, I, I was responsible for organizing a, a conference on the Vietnam War that was supposed to be about a four-day uh, kind of thing that um, uh, Mrs. Eula Lauchs, who I think is watching this uh, today or tonight, uh, sort of sponsored. And because we didn't, um, we had experts who could talk to us about military policy and the, the philosophy of the United States in getting involved in Vietnam, but we had no Vietnam vets. Shad was the first Vietnam vet that I met in a way that was a significant encounter for me. Uh, and when I met Shad, um, um, I, I learned that um, there's an awful lot more to the Vietnam War than can be written down in the history books. There's a lot more to the Vietnam War that can be put down in the manuals about, about military strategy. Indeed, when um, I say indeed because I learned how to talk that way too, but I, it's just enough to say in fact, I think. Uh, I. Um, uh, I got, I got my, my perspective on the Vietnam War by listening carefully to what um, Shad Mishad was talking about and by observing closely and carefully what his life became about after he came back from the Vietnam War. Now, Wilson Hubble up here has, has uh, heard me say this before, but I, th I have referred to Shad as Mr. Vietnam, um, and, and by that I mean that he has been involved in all of it. Um, he is the, the co-founder, along with Bill Mahidi, of the Veterans Outreach Program. And the Veterans Outreach Program is the predecessor uh, institution to the, to the vet centers around the country. The vet centers happened because Shad went before the Congressional Committee uh, way back in, I don't know, 1978 or 79, and, and convinced Congress that the vet center program uh, ought to be funded. It was Shad who did the talking then. It was also Bill who did the writing of that proposal, but they, they, they worked on that together. Uh, when it came time for um, there to be a national salute to the Vietnam veterans, there again, Shad was in, not, in, not just in the middle of it, but the, but the leader of it, one of the leaders of it. He was there in Washington when the memorial was um, dedicated in 1982. Uh, he has probably met and counseled more Vietnam vets than any other human being, and he's a Vietnam vet himself, having served uh, 12 years in Vietnam as a psychology officer. And his life since he went to Vietnam has been Vietnam. Uh, he is currently the executive director of the Vietnam Veterans Aid Foundation in Los Angeles, after having served as the, the West Coast, um, uh, getting some of this language not quite right, but the, the director of the 
of the Veterans Outreach Program. On the first trip that Vietnam veterans made to the Soviet Union to meet with vets from the Afghan War, of course there was Shad leading that delegation. When the New York Times article, the first article that came out about that, um, was published, it was about Shad and the encounters that he had had with the Soviet vets. When the vets came to this country, the, the vets from the Soviet Union, to meet up with American vets in this land, again it was Shad who organized that, uh, who met those people, and uh, he continues to do it, continues to do it um, uh, to this day. Uh, <clears throat> there would not um, be a class of, of this kind of dimensions or with this perspective at UCSB uh, had it not been for Shad Mishad. Well, I said I was not going to take uh, time from, from his presentation to make a long introduction, but I've, I'm deliberately cutting this short because one of the keys to my success is to try to see the world through the eyes of Shad Mishad. I'm very pleased today to present him as the co-founder, the co-founder of this class. Please welcome Shad Mishad. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, Twelve years uh, have gone. <laughs> enough of Shad Mishad, but never enough of Walter. Uh, I am one of the, I've always said I'm the most blessed person I've ever met in my life. I, I really am. Uh, and one of the big blessings is from so many people in this room is Walter Capps. I always considered him not just a unique comedian, but a magician. And, as, and it continues way past uh, his physical presence here. It just echoes through everybody and still to, to me. Uh, you know, that moment uh, at, on Montecito Mountain in this mansion with uh, a colleague, Fred Downs, we were the two Vietnam vets who were to tell these internationally known political scientists that had written about our war. And Walter was smart enough to say, well, maybe we should bring somebody there that was in the war. And Fred suffered quite a bit like Senator Bob here. Uh, they lost body parts. I mean, I, I, my soul, I, I used to say I got lost, but it got dark. But we were there after listening to these six people these six professors from all over the world talk about our war. Walter knew just the timing when they finished, they took a break and brought us on. And Fred looks at me and says, you want to go first? And I go, no, Fred, you go first. I told this last night. He had this chrome arm and shoulder. He had his shoulder blown off in Vietnam. He's an author, too, The Killing Zone. Uh, I hadn't written my book yet, but he cocked his arm on this beautiful Camp David type pool table with all the speakers with all these people in front of us and drilled it into that table and the first thing I thought is we have to pay for this we have to, he just drilled it you could see the imprint and he started and then I went on and that's when really the very explosion in Walter's mind this is somehow going to be taught and then from then on, I spent every month at Walter's home. I watched his kids grow up. I slept in the oldest's bed. And we started talking, and I started introducing him to some of my colleagues that were actually on the streets. My nickname was the Madman. Uh, I was very angry for a good reason uh, about how we were treated uh, those coming back, you know, I've always said we fought the war in Vietnam and we fought the war coming home. I don't think anybody has done that. It, to my knowledge, maybe Bob knows because he's well read. But I was just a street guy, but I listened every day up until 77 to the voices of those I was working with to bring home in Los Angeles, which had a population of 335,000 Vietnam-era veterans in one city, actually the county. And I listened to their stories from Watts, South Central, East LA, Venice Beach, the canyons. Uh, we did a piece on 60 Minutes with 
these Marines that had dug up into the mountains to hide out uh, from society. And those stories need to be told. What Walter did, however this happened, whether it was me, Fred, or who knows, brought the stories to the world via this university by starting this class. The first class we did in 79, there were 50. Three Vietnam vets in that class. We didn't know. We just did this thing. It was really for non-veterans, we thought, to tell our story. And then the next year, 500. And the rest of the time, it was Campbell Hall. It was packed. There were people outside standing. This, this class got so popular, as, as Dr. Hicks said, you know, two times on 60 Minutes. It just evolved. It was a force. It was the class in America every year. And almost a 1,000 students or whatever. It really enhanced my work knowing that I didn't have to stay in the bowels of L.A. just working, trying to bring broken soldiers back. But there was a voice now, and it came through Walter and the class. And then I got attention, and I went to Washington, and I had to battle Republicans that were World War II vets that called us crybabies, and that was the big fight. And I was, I enjoyed my anger in trying to tell them it's not about quantity of time, it's about quality. And, and yeah, we served a year, and I remember Tiger Teague. He was this big congressman, and he was the head of the Veterans Affairs. And I used to go at him head on every, from 77, 78 until Public Law 96, 22 got pulled through after he retired. Uh, Carter and, and whatever got the vote, but, uh, and it was interesting. Uh, I was nominated for the Olin Teague Award as a finalist. Two years later, and his wife came up to me and said, he really liked you. He loved John with you or whatever. But, you know, it was always a battle for us. It was always a battle to say, hey, either we, we were this or we were that or the war was unpopular, you know. People would say, you lost the war. We never lost a battle. Go figure. I mean, I'm not a politician. I'm sure Bob agrees. Be, people did not want to address the fact that... Uh, this war was a scar on our history, and, and the scars uh, remain even today with our new wars. And uh, the family, I mean, to be welcomed into his family, I mean, to be in Lois and Walter's home and be a part of the home and developing, it was just a synergy that came. And... Uh, it's, it's just been a miracle. I, I, like I said, when I really hit me was at, at his funeral, the mission, and roped off for all these students, and they're yelling, and, and I felt, uh, in a way, I came home because how much the class had meant to them. That was the important thing. I, I knew what the war was about. I knew I'm dealing with it today uh, with the National Veterans Foundation. Uh, my book, I'm author, uh, on, on my year in Vietnam, I was a mental health officer. I was flying into combat zones. I had no authority, but I was supposed to counsel troops in a traumatic situation. Uh, and it was like, it took me 10 years to say, okay, well, you know, it's not all about the combat and all the special effects we see today in war. It's really what's going on in the heart and souls of people in the stand-down areas, in the hospitals, uh, the pilots, the boaters, and they, it, was, it was just uh, a summation, and, and you know, I, I, I tried to tell that side of the story. It's, it's finally, after 40-something years, it's on Amazon, but it's, it's not a combat story. It's a soul story. It's about the dark. It's, it's Mahiti, my colleague and dear friend of Walter, uh, the dark side of our spirituality. You know, I kept saying we lost our souls. It was dark, and... Uh, Walter played a big role in bringing light to us and to the, to the world, starting with the students and with all the publications, the books that he put out, at least two books about uh, this journey. And we're still going on it today. And I'm blessed, given that I'm going to be 80 next year, that I've been able to continue to do the work uh, 
And it really, what drives me are the young OEF, OIF vets that are on my team. Uh, they're all disabled. <laughs> They've all been raided with post-traumatic stress. And uh, you couldn't buy those individuals. I mean, uh, I, I've just been blessed, but it starts here. This university, I think, really, in my opinion, opened the world up to really the totality of the experience, whether it's from the top, from a Medal of Honor winner, a senator, a governor. We had a voice, and I think Walter, I'm, I'm prejudiced, I think Walter gave us that voice. And the Caps gave me a family here on the West Coast that, that I didn't have. And Walter was listening and said, we need to get this out. And uh, I'm looking. Yesterday I met some of the class members in, in the mid-80 classes that we did. And it just uh, melted me. They're here today. And that's really what this was all about. And they're here because something happened in that class, in that course. And uh, I'll be walking through airports. I've been all over the world. I'm obviously a pioneer in post-traumatic stress. So I, I'd lecture and teach and things like that. It's a different thing. I used to think, I used to tell people the only good thing that came out of Vietnam was me, alive, and the definition of PTSD. That was about it. <laughs> Uh, probably wrong. Bob may have feel different, but it, you know, and everybody thought it was initially when we got it defined, it was just Vietnam vets that had post traumatic stress. <laughs> we were like, oh, we've got this disease or whatever, and now it's worldwide. It's we understand that trauma, near death experiences, uh, have effects on the brain and the emotions, which are all embedded there, embedded there, and uh, the journey goes on, the beat goes on. I I, I can't tell you how late. <laughs> to see Bob here and his humor, but I really miss Walter's humor because uh, I just had so many blessed years with him, different than many of, of the folks, and uh, uh, I think the, this class changed a lot of lives. So I think my time may be up. I don't know if we Thank got a few more. Huh? Yeah. Thank okay. you very much, <laughs> And... Uh, I think I share all of our appreciation of you allowing us to hear the voice of Walter and to see him again. Thank you very much. Did, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Uh, okay, so we have a, uh, a bit of time for us to talk amongst ourselves and I have a, have a question um, that I would love to hear your answers to. Why was the course so powerful? Who are you asking that question? Both of you. Oh, both of you. You want to go first, Bob? I mean, I don't know. I just think. I mean, I, what I do know is. You hand me yours. Oh. <laughs> All right. So, what I'm what I know for certain is lots of people have tried to duplicate it and they can't. So. Uh, there was something magical about it, and I think the less time you spend trying to figure out why it was successful, um, the happier you'll be. <laughs> <laughs> Did Walter rub off on you? <laughs> You've always been funny. <laughs> he says, I'm, I'm going to change the subject. I uh, spent 16 years in politics. I learned how to answer a question other than the one that was asked, <laughs> and I'm going to do it again now. So. You said something, Chad, that I think is uh, a lot of things that were very, very important, but said something that um, um, it never occurred to me that I should respond and say that you're wrong on this. Because it was accepted wisdom that we lost the war. Um, and it's a majority verb, and it's used a lot, and it's not the case. We decided to come home. We made a choice to end the war, uh, and it was the right choice to make. It wasn't without consequences. Um, you know, thank God we had Ted Kennedy and, and Gerald Ford who made it possible for over a million Vietnamese to find refuge in the United States. Um, so it, it's not like it was free of any consequences. We just decided uh, we're coming home. We didn't negotiate it. We had negotiated an agreement to get our, our prisoners of war out, but uh, we basically said the war is over. It was a wise and good thing to do.
uh, the old saying, the truth will set you free. I, I think it... Uh, I don't think I'm overstating it. I think America had all these opinions, lost this, that, or whatever about the war, but we were definitely, uh, people were really nervous approaching us, and we really didn't want to talk to civilians, uh, particularly uh, probably with all soldiers. I mean, my father, my uncles, they, you know, they really never really wanted to talk about it because it's not, it, it's horrible. It's man's inhumanity to man when it comes down there, kill or be killed. But through Walter's class, and we had to start with young 18, 19, 20-year-olds to tell them the truth about who we are as American soldiers, whether, you know, this case, the Vietnam War, and they heard the truth, nothing but the truth. And we had a voice through this class, and it continued for years and hopefully that was a start of spreading it to the rest of the country because they got a lot of coverage, and all of a sudden it was okay for us to talk about the people that have to, to be the spent rounds, the ones that have to go in, good, bad, or indifferent, to serve their country in a war, popular or unpopular, to talk about it. And it was interesting that, to me, and I've been all over the world, it started in this class. That's my opinion. And combat vets like Bob and, and Hubble and all of them came in and we finally had a place to go. It's like people that go to therapy have a place to go and, you know, we can talk about what we're struggling with. But everybody was struggling about what really happened, you know, whether it was politically, individually or whatever. We had a chance and it was like so therapeutic uh, for everybody including the soldier, for people to be able to talk and ask questions and talk about really what it was really like and not what you see in movies or whatever. I used to say, oh, God, you guys, it was terrible. I said, you couldn't smell it. You didn't walk in it. You didn't feel the heat. You didn't feel the anxiety. You can walk out of a movie. You can eat your popcorn, drink your Coke, and walk out. And say, Woo, glad I'm out of there. You can't do that in a war. That sort of stuff came out in this class tell it like it is and some was brutal there were times I, I forgot you know because I had street language then I mean I talked like you know it took me years to I had to take acting before I went to Washington so I didn't turn people off saying four-letter words because that was my language and I had to learn you know uh, polite language to talk to the politicians or whatever you're not going to curse them or whatever nothing's going to happen but it's. Uh, I could have briefed you. <laughs> I know it, <laughs> Bob. You were, you were too busy. To, uh, but you know, it's an honor to be sitting here. I just left Atlanta. I was with several Medal of Honor winners. I was inducted in the Veterans Hall of Fame with Colin Powell and some other people. But sitting with these people uh, was just wonderful. And I'm sitting with one right now. I mean, a legendary Bob Carey. But the fact that we can sit here, because I was a street dog, and it was very difficult when Max Cleland and, and President Carter brought me in to push and sell the Vet Center program. You know, Afro, Afro beard, I was, I, I, I looked like, I was a street dog. I looked just like the guys on the streets, and I had to learn the language. I had to at least, you know, the messenger had to be listened to. I learned a lot. I cut my hair, shaved my beard. I, and as best I could, and try to put on a suit and not curse. But uh, somehow I got through it. God is good. <laughs> I, 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 I want to ask, I just want to push. I, I would hate to disagree with a distinguished senator and governor of the state where I was born. Um, but can't we say more than it was just magical that this class had this power? Uh, I, I'd like to push that just a bit because there's a real difference between what um, Bob said and what um, Shad said. What's the difference? Well, what, I, I, unlike you, I don't hate to disagree with you. So, what, 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 what's the difference between what Chad said and I said? Walter created this class, and it can't be done again. There's no Walter. 
There was a magical moment. He seized an opportunity and, and had guys like Shad leading it out. It was, it was spectacular. And there's no need to feel terrible because we can't create it again. I can't create Woodstock again. I'd love to. Um, you know, yeah, you, you might have been there, that no. uh, first one. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see it as, a, as a, an admission of failure or defeat. It's just we can't, sometimes you just can't recreate the magic. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, in fact, it can be something wrong with it because you can end up, you know, feeling terrible because you can't create something that was wonderful. That doesn't sound to me like a good thing to do. Um, I think that we have time now for some questions or comments uh, from the audience members. And what I would like to suggest that there are two microphones at, at the stage. And if you would like to make, uh, raise a question or a comment, uh, please step forward. I see someone standing up. No? Hello, Richard. I'm surprised you remembered me. <laughs> I, um, maybe this isn't appropriate, but I want to bring up something new. We were talking about losing the war. And I believed we lost the war. And we, did pull, we didn't lose military, we pulled out. And I went back to Vietnam after being away for 50 years. And I was there about a week and I'm looking around and I'm going, uh, these buildings are all brand new. They got Christian Dior and uh, all these high-end uh, high uh, uh, stores there. And um, isn't, I'm asking you, isn't communism primarily an economic system? No. It, it's not? No. Okay. Political system and an economic. Well, yeah, but it is political. Well, but if you're if you're a, if you're a citizen of a communist yeah. country, you sure as hell know the difference. Yeah. And the people of Vietnam know. I mean, I'm, I think we absolutely did the right thing of withdrawing. Oh yeah, no, but but, but my point was, is you go to Vietnam now, and their economic system is capitalism. Hold a demonstration against the policies of the of the. Of the yeah. country, see how they see how they greet you. And, and but the uh, the lineage of the government there is communist. It's not a totalitarian regime, as far as I can tell. I've been there four times. I was in Hanoi about in in September, and um, I tell people, veterans, if you want to go back and relive the war, the only thing you're going to relive is the heat and the humidity. Everything else is different. And right now, my observation is it's a lot happier place than the United States. It is a lot safer than the United States. Um, you go to Vietnam, and it's all right to be from California. <laughs> they don't help you. And I go to Vietnam, and they wave at me, and they say, where are you from? I don't say the United States anymore. I say, California! You don't do that in Oklahoma. But uh, So I, I'm trying to say it's just like... Uh, we won the Cold War, and in Vietnam, maybe we lost uh, initially, but I don't think we completely lost because it's, uh, their uh, economic system is primarily capitalism, and that's just from a high school graduate. I'm a casual observer there. And, and I'll tell you, since we go back to the class, let's say the main thing I learned about the class was I did two tours in Vietnam. Both of them were completely different. And the thing I learned here is they're not just one Vietnam story. Everyone was different. Everyone was different. And, and, and people came out of that war different. That's all I got to say. Who's next? You said it very well. I think that belongs in the front. Okay. Yes, it is. I okay, think so. Look, I mean, the only reason I mentioned the, the, the winning and losing of the war is that there's a, a revisionist effort going on right now that we uh, didn't lose the war, that we didn't have to lose the war, that we surrendered. We didn't surrender. Uh, we made a conscious decision to withdraw, and it was the right decision. The call, and it was, a, I think, an accurate, uh, 
uh, analysis that if you really want to win the war uh, by the definition of the, uh, the people who plan such things, uh, the cost was too high. It was too high as it was. Um, but so uh, it, there's no need for us to feel shame, other than what we did while we were there, uh, that we st stopped fighting that war. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a wise and a good thing to do. Hi, Mr. Okay, I think we have another question. Hi, Mr. M-E-S-H-A-D and Senator Kerry. Um, I'm, my name is Tu Pham, and I'm a former student of this class. Oh. And um, oh. I'm going to sort of be an annoying person and not ask a question, but um, make a comment. And um, like Senator Kerry, I'm not going to try to sort of decode the magic of Walter's it was, class. It was her father I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Uh, um, but I think what was wonderful about the class was that it created moments that, as Senator Kerry said, you can't capture. And I want to channel him for a moment. And one of the things I think he would stop Do you actually know what's inside here that you're going to? No, not you. No. I'm going to channel, channel I'm sorry. Walter. I'm going to channel Walter, Walter for a good. moment. And what I think he would do is um, sort of um, the moment that I'm, I'm trying to um, capture is that um, it's for someone like me who was born in Vietnam to have an opportunity to thank veterans for really the bravery and the courage and the sacrifice that you all made so that I could stand here and acknowledge this on Veterans Day. So I just wanted to take a moment and ask any of the veterans who are here today to, to stand, please, as Walter would very much have asked people to do. So that we can and I'm gone. Hi, uh, I was also, um, uh, went to this class in 1985. Oh, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here with uh, some of my friends that were also in that class with me. And um, yeah, you know, I just, it, this is also more of a comment just to say that I think the power of this class for, you know, 17, 18, 19 year olds, which is what we were way back then, um, in addition to just the exposure to this perspective that we might not have had just on our own, was that it really posed for us, you know, an opportunity to think about our moral code, our sense of purpose, who we were going to be in the world, how we were going to walk through it. And like that's getting an emotional. <laughs> but that's what college is about, you know, this experience was like, impacted me my whole life. I mean, I'm turning 60 this year, and I think about this class all the time. I have a daughter who's 17. You know, I was, I guess I was 19 when I took this class. Like, it's crazy to me, and it just has really, really stayed with me the whole time. And, um, and Walter gave me that gift, and all of you. You know, it was, um, so thank you, and um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, I was asked to speak last night. Um, I, too, was in this class. I also was um, in Professor Capp's class, um, The History of Religion, when he taught it with Steve Allen. Um, and I think in terms of contextualizing it, um, or, or let me start with why the magic of the class. Um, UC Santa Barbara, um, when I was there, the top two classes, it was not just the Vietnam vet class, it was the sociology of sex, also in Campbell Hall. <laughs> and I am a mother of a sophomore UCSB student. I think, you know, it reminds me of like the class at Yale, the number one class, it's on happiness. Does UC Santa Barbara need a class on happiness? No. <laughs> it is more what is relevant, what is, I think, UCSB students pushed the boundaries, and that this class certainly did. Um, and in my life, I was, um, I actually was a political science major and managed to get a job um, as a foreign service officer with USAID. So I served my country around the world for more than two decades. And I was, when I was in South Africa, working on the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the horrors there, lessons from this class. I applied, right? It was bring the voices to the table, have the hard conversations from very different perspectives and honor all of those. I used those lessons in El Salvador as well. 
when I went to, I was working in Vietnam on a PEPFAR funded, which is HIV AIDS funding, um, setting up the social, uh, the school for social work in Vietnam. Of course, I went back to the class, um, in the Vietnam vet class, and what did I learn? What did I remember? What could I read about that would help me inform uh, to better understand those people, you know, the, the Vietnamese and what we were trying to get through with the current um, government of Vietnam. So I think it's not just the magic of the class, but I, you know, I can only imagine if you went to all of us, the lessons that you'd capture and how we applied all of those lessons, you know, not just uh, locally in Santa Barbara or the state or the country, but worldwide. So thank you um, to all of you. Thank you very much. I, I think we have time for one more question. Got it. I guess that's me. I wanted to say thank you, first of all, to both our speakers and to Professor. And it, uh, it strikes me that one of the most basic things that I learned, not from the class, but from writing about the class, I was an outsider in that way, but I'm a professional journalist who uh, is grateful for the fact that people talked honestly to each other and to the audience that would come. And that, I thought, was one of the greatest contributions, not just to me as a writer, but to the world who would listen, because it's sometimes talking truth to power. Other times, it's from the heart. And all these things kind of come to, came together under, initially, Walter's aegis, and then others who took up the torch. And I wanted to thank you for doing that. One more. So, sorry, uh, Laura said I could go. <laughs> um, so I, I, I have a little different perspective. Um, I just realized, I don't know why I just realized, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska. And I, <laughs> like I just, <laughs> um, my, dad was in the, my dad was in the Air Force, and he was in Vietnam, and African-American man, so he was there in, I think, 65, 66. I looked it up last night that 25% of the men who died in Vietnam were black men, although they were, I don't know, maybe we were, they were 10% of the population or less and 12% in the um, war. And I remember after I was with Lisa in the class um, in 85, and I, I am 60 now. I call it sexy, just so you know. Um, but my father never, ever talked about it, would never talk about it. And he had a wound from bullet in his leg, and he wouldn't even talk about that. And one time, I. Um, Walter said, you know, talk to your father. We had to write a paper, I think, and I was a math major and I never wrote anything. And, um, and I took that sociology of sex class, too. <laughs> I just remembered that. Um, and I, he finally, he was a little drunk, he finally talked to me about what it was like. He had only told me he did communications, he, he had top secret clearance, couldn't talk about it. And he talked about it that night, and he talked about what started the war, and he told me it was false, it wasn't real, they made it up. What started the war, not the Tet Offensive, but they were monitoring something in the ocean, I can't remember what it was called. It was the golf of talking, yeah. Yeah, and so, and I sat there, and that was a gift that Walter gave me, that I, ne I was always afraid to talk to my father about that, and it really changed our relationship after that, and I was just sitting here thinking about that, and how now it's come full circle. I'm an um, I'm a Boo, an Episcopalian Buddhist, and my teacher is a Vietnamese monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, and it's like, how did this all come together? The universe does strange things. But I just wanted to thank Walter, thank family, and thank all of you for bringing and change, literally changing my life. And my perspective in my life has stayed this, not the same, but it's because of this class. So thank you. Wow, thank you. Before I thank our two speakers, I'd like to uh, close our meeting today 
the way that we closed this course for 40 years. Um, and that was uh, um, Wilson. And Wilson would tell the class the following. And I'd like to uh, read Wilson's words to the class every uh, year for those 40 or so years. You have, Wilson would say, you have three choices. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. Because of who you are, where you are, and what you are, we expect that you will lead. Here is my point. You must lead. You're the best we've got. You must lead. Thank you very, very much, uh, Shad and Bob, for joining us and leading us in this discussion and recollection of this extraordinary class that was really magical. Thank you very much. You guys were great, and I, I'm so touched. I only wish I had had the chance to take that very class. Um, please join us for a coffee break right now uh, for 15 minutes, and we'll reconvene at uh, 1045 and, and carry on. Okay, thank you.
We're going to get started. Is there one more? No, nope, there's just three of us. Oh, okay. And so um, they want to make sure it looks like we're, we can see each other to have the conversation. So that's why it's kind of. Okay. So sit down and see how it goes. Okay. Hello. Ooh, it works. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Right. The front of the class gets the A's today. Yes, we do. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to um, go ahead and get us started. I was told I have to eat the mic. That's a term I had not heard before. <laughs> like this. Excellent. Good job. Okay, well, so far from my understanding, this has been a wonderful event and I feel very privileged and lucky to be invited to be part of it. Um, you have three individuals in front of you here on stage that have different experiences to share and what their relationship with Walter Capps was and still is and how it's influenced our lives. And so I'm going to begin by introducing the three of us, and then we're going to talk about how Walter Capps touched our lives. Sound good? Okay. So I'm, this is the reading part. The rest won't be reading. Hopefully what we will be doing is having more of a dialogue and then providing some time for you to, if you have any questions, and then some audience comments. And I'd love to see a continuation of the wonderful comments that I was hearing before this particular panel. So speaker bios. My name is Katya Armistead. My pronouns are she and her. I am an assistant vice chancellor and dean of student life here at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, let's see what was written about me. I oversee organizational departments. So the AVC part is basically within the Division of Student Affairs. I have about 10 departments that report up through me. 
Um, also, I am basically the dean of students, and that means a whole bunch of things. Um, but and how I would define it best is I support and I advocate and I um, uplift and I listen to students and I try to provide their perspective in places maybe they don't have access to. I work a lot with student leaders. Um, so it says here, overseeing organizational departments, programs, policies, and initiatives that promote growth and achievement. I have a doctorate degree from UCSB in educational leadership. I also received my bachelor's degree in sociology from UCSB. I have coached professionals and college students in the areas of leadership, diversity and inclusion, organizational development, crisis management, and advising. I co-direct or I co-teach a class within religious studies in partnership with the CAP Center a Civic Engagement Scholars Program. And that has been a true pleasure, and I've learned so much by doing that. I also teach in the Gewurz Graduate School of Education, a course for upper division undergraduates, educational um, or uh, leadership development. And that has been a great pleasure. So I also have with me Tim. Tim Kring has created and run numerous TV shows, including Crossing Jordan, Touch, and Heroes. And, um, be, and become an industry-leading creator in multi-platform storytelling over a 35-year career in Hollywood. His writing focuses on themes of interconnectivity and global consciousness with the goal of achieving what he calls social benefit storytelling. Ooh, I can't wait to hear more about that. Sean Landry's has a distinguished record of research, leadership, and impact across the social good sectors. He has chaired Los Angeles County's Quality and Productivity Commission, as well as Santa Monica's Planning and Social Services Commissions. Co-founder of Jumpstart Labs and a senior fellow at UCLA Luskin. Sean is a board member of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs and Santa Monica Bay Area Human Relations Council. He has a PhD in relig religious studies here at UC Santa Barbara. So welcome, you both. Um, I've just been talking a lot, so I'm going to go to one of you next to talk about what's your relationship with Walter Capps. Tell me a little bit more. Um, well, I, I, it's it's a bit of a. I think there's a little bit of a story to tell before I, of how Excellent. how that happened because I think I'm sort of a unique um, voice in this event in that I um, was not an academic and um, and I, I actually predated the the Vietnam course so so my involvement with with um, with Walter was just as a, he was a professor of classes that I was taking as an undergraduate, but uh, to give you some context of all of it, because it's, I, I grew up a, um, about an hour north of here in a community that had very little interest in education. I don't think we had passed a school bond in, you know, I don't know, 50 years in this community. And, um, and I actually went to, um, uh, I graduated from, at the time, the only unaccredited high school in California. Um, so, uh, education was just not very, you know, wasn't, wasn't stressed in, in my life. Uh, I also, on top of that, had learning disabilities that were never diagnosed. Um, I just sat in the back of the classroom and didn't, didn't pick up on much. And so, I, I took a, uh, a film class, filmmaking class at a junior college, and, um, decided that's what I wanted to do, uh, wanted to get into film. And this film teacher that I had said, you know, I don't go to film school as an undergraduate because film school is sort of a trade school. It's a technical thing and it's, and uh, he said, you know, you should go and learn how to think and learn how to read and learn how to write and, and take a sort of broader education, and then you can always go to film school after that, and, and uh, you know, once you've, once you've done that. So, at the time, 
you know, UCSB now to get into UCSB is a very difficult thing, but I have to say, and I don't even really re re recall how it happened, but I, I actually don't think, I, I don't think I applied to go to school here. I, I actually think all I did was enroll. I think I just came down and I, I paid. That's how it happened in those days. Yeah. I just enrolled. I, I paid $214 for a quarter, for 15 units in a quarter. And I started taking classes with the idea that I was going to learn to educate. I was going to educate myself for the first time. And um, so uh, I, um, and to, to just to back up a tiny bit even further, the interest in the religious studies part of it was, um, you know, I was thinking sort of about life and my meaning, the meaning of life and what my purpose was and all of that. And there was something that my grandmother had said, she had died a couple years before, um, and I must have been about 16 or 17 years old. She said, um, you know, I always, um, I always regretted that you kids didn't have more of a, a, a Jewish upbringing. You know, my parents were atheists and but you know we were we were we were traditionally Jewish and some some culturally Jewish but not religiously Jewish, and uh, and she said you know I, I I just really regret that you kids didn't grow up with a real strong you know Jewish identity, and I was like well why? you know I was sort of a child of the 60s and early 70s and I was like well what difference does it make I mean why you know who who cares, and she said well it's important that you know why when I was your age, people spit in my face. That was her comment to me. And, um, you know, that sort of bounced around in my head for a couple of years. And so when I got here and saw that I could take a class in, 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 uh, in Jewish studies from, from uh, Richard Hecht, uh, I, t I took that class. And then I fell in love with the whole idea of a, of a, of a religious studies major because I was seeking this kind of broad liberal arts education. And, um, and that's how I got to, to, to uh, Walter Capps' class. And so, I mean, that's, that's the backstory. I don't know if I, I can get to the other part afterwards. Yeah, why don't we go to okay. you? Well, if we're, you're, in, you're inspiring some backstory here um, because it, it, Roberto Colasso, um, The Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony, if, if anyone knows the book, has this wonderful question, but, but how did it all begin? Um, and I think uh, what, what comes up in this conversation, at the beginning of this conversation, is the question of origins. Um, and I'm thinking back, so my Santa Barbara story starts oddly early. I had I went to undergrad at Columbia, but somewhere along the way, I had been a, um, this, is the, this is the tuba connection, although I don't play the tuba, I had been a music person in high school, and I had been a composer, and I had put in an application at some point to the College of Creative Studies, um, where Tomoko and Walter taught in the 70s, um, and I won a scholarship to UCSB's CCS, um, that I couldn't take because I was already committed to go to Columbia. And shortly after my sophomore, was it my sophomore year? It was my, no, it was my, my first year. Um, I don't need to go into the long version of how we got there. Um, I was, I found myself in the, in the summer of 1991 um, the early summer of 1991, I found myself at a meeting of the, I believe it was called the Coalition for Democratic Values at the time. And this was the counterpart to the Democratic Leadership Council, uh, which was the other wing of the, of the Democratic Party at that time. We, Senator Kerry was talking about the um, Bush administration. There were obviously the, 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 Democratic Party was in the throes of an identity crisis. I mean, it, it's a Saturday, so the Democratic Party's in the throes of an identity <laughs> crisis. Um, and I listened all day um, to some interesting policy discussions. I was by probably 25 years the youngest person in the room. 
And at the end of the day, the person I had really come to hear walked into the room. Uh, he was the governor of a very small state in the southeast of the United States. And um, pretty young guy, walked into boos and hisses from his Democratic colleagues and ended his speech to a standing ovation. And I thought, mm, there's something here. And so a month later, I found myself driving this governor in my parents' Volvo all over LA as he was laying his plans uh, for what would be an October announcement to run for president of the United States. And as we were passing the federal building, uh, Veteran Avenue in LA, it's Veterans Day, uh, I slipped in a cassette to the player. Does, we, does everybody know what a cassette is? Okay. <laughs> And I said, Governor, I, you know, if you're going to run for president, I think this should be your theme song. And we played Don't Stop. And uh, the, the, the aide in the back seat was ready to throttle me at that point because um, Governor Clinton and I had this banter going that was totally distracting. He was, he's that kind of guy. Um, but I then spent a lot of time in college. I'm telling the story because I spent some time in college working on his campaign as Laura um, as, as Laura knows, and then she worked in the White House um, with George Stephanopoulos. Uh, and uh, when I had, I, I did an internship in uh, college at the White House, which was a, it was a challenging experience to say the least. It was a meaningful experience that actually set up some of my career interests in government innovation, but it was also a very challenging experience for, for a number of reasons. Um, and I ultimately came back I was an unhappy history major at, at Columbia, and I came back and I really solidified myself as a religion major with the advice from one of my mentors at, uh, in this internship who said, you know, if you can do something else, if you, if you want to stay in politics, you will find yourself going up the ladder and people will go up the ladder over you and then they will climb over you as they go down the ladder and if you are dependent on the ladder, you're not gonna be fulfilled. Go get a degree. She was pretty colorful about it. She called it an FU degree that would allow you to step off the ladder at any time and have a career. And I ultimately chose, for, chose religion and found myself in the spring of 1994 with a letter signed by Walter Capps, who was the chair of the department, admitting me to UCSB for the Religious Studies PhD program um, and I was really excited to, to get to Santa Barbara and, and I had a, a great, it was a great fellowship. Um, but of course, when I got there, um, Walter was nowhere to be found because he was busy running for Congress <laughs> against Andrea Seastrand. So I was very, I, I'm gonna go study with Walter and I'm gonna study with Wade Clark Roof and I'm gonna study with Philip Hammond and all of the greats. And, um, and we'll talk about this more as we keep going, but that's sort of my backstory. How did I, how did I get to know him? And I'll, I'll fast forward, which is that um, to, in the, obviously the race did not go the way we had all hoped um, in 1994. What, was it four votes? 12,000. 12, okay, might as well have been four votes, but it felt, you know, 1,200, not 12,000, 1,200. I mean, it was like... Right, okay. So he lose, I mean, he lost by this tiny amount. Um, it was 94, the country did a whole bunch of weird things in 1994. Um, but I then ultimately um, found a way to connect with Walter uh, over my doctoral exams the following year, and we got to spend some time together. So I'll come back to that, but um, that's sort of the backstory as someone who was really interested in politics and found my way, kind of backed my way into the study of religion because of my interest, my core interest in values and how they motivated people. And I, and I always felt that the 1992 election was about values and that Governor Clinton had done a really good job of showing people that it was not just, I mean, yes, it was the economy stupid, but it was also about building a connection around shared values. That's perfect. What um, something, that definitely influenced me by taking two of um, Professor Capps's courses were the storytelling. And so how appropriate that we're starting this panel with sharing our story. 
So my story is I am a Californian. I grew up in Pasadena, California. First generation college student, low income, mixed race. My father's African American, my mother's white. Um, my mother was a single parent. I wasn't even going to go to college. I had a hidden, not hidden, I had a learning disability. Um, and I was a terrible student in high school. Hated history, hated history. That was my downfall for sure. And um, it was my math teacher, you know, Katya, you got a fee waiver to take the SAT, which was a terrible score. <laughs> Um, but you get a fee waiver to apply to UC. So why don't you apply to UC? And I'm like, ah, okay, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I'm from the last graduating class, I think, from a high school that can only apply to one UC campus. And um, back in the day, they were admitting anybody eligible. So it was probably you were just signed up and you can go. Um, I do have spent my first 17 years working as a professional here at UCSB in the Office of Admissions, so I know how it works. Um, but I, did, I wasn't even UC eligible. I was admitted on affirmative action. And I always like to tell folks that if there's a lot of, there is a lot of criticism and, and um, skepticism around affirmative action, but having earned my doctorate degree from UCSB and the title that I have, if I'm not a living embodiment of what it can do for an individual and give back, then I don't know what is. So um, I came to UCSB. But it was true, I was not academically ready to be here. And I struggled. I still am amazed to this day that I graduated and it was a lot of caring individuals, especially in um, student affairs with educational opportunity program, having a counselor there and, and people rooting for me. Um, I spent a lot of time in Campbell Hall. I worked for arts and lectures in work study and I had a wonderful supervisor that championed me. So a lot of loving individuals helped, helped me get through college. I remember sitting in this classroom, taking the Vietnam War, the, the Vietnam course, and hearing the stories and being very impacted by hearing individuals that had their own struggles or were treated a particular way. I, I heard in the last uh, public co the comments, um, you know, at that time when I graduated from UCSB in 1988, so the AIDS epidemic. So another course um, that really was impacting me was in so the sociology of AIDS. And also I took the Baldwin's Sociology 152, the sex class. And what they all had in common was hearing the stories of real people and triumph, not triumph, but um, what we call today more the grit, or, and learning people's history and story. And I think that's what gave me some confidence that I could do this. I could get through UCSB because other people had gone through a whole bunch and they managed to get to the other side. And so my story being first generation, mixed race, so poor, oh my gosh. I, I celebrate today what we do on college campuses around basic needs and food pantries, um, getting students computers who can't afford to get their own computers, all of that. I, I only wish I had some of those resources when I was an undergraduate because I went without very often. And it was hearing the stories of welcoming Vietnam vets back and helping them feel belong, belonging because I think that's what I got from that class, is starting to feel like I belonged. And then I took the first um, course he taught, uh, Voices of a Stranger, which again, it was highlighting the triumphs of folks that looked like me, who, um, um, who had AIDS, you know, who had disabilities, and seeing what they had done with their life, and see, seeing how he welcomed them and told them that they belonged really impacted me and helped me graduate from UCSB. So let's... Yeah, can I yeah. jump in? Because I've been thinking a lot about, about what, what Walter's influence on me has been 
um, in the con and I and I can't I, I feel the need because we're um, we're in this space and this is also a, you know a religious studies conversation I, I feel the need to um, acknowledge uh, those who aren't here with us and yet still are here with us very much in mind um, for me uh, Ninian Smart um, Clark Roof uh, Phil Hammond um, I know for many others, Dick Comstock, um, Bob Michelson, we, we are a department that honors our history. There are many others, um, but what I've been thinking about, and I was, um, Clark was my dissertation director, uh, and, um, and Walter and Lois were great friends um, to Clark and Terry, uh, uh, also blessed memory, um, who, uh, who, who spent the last I think 30 years of their lives in, in Santa Barbara, um, and, uh, and, and shared, shared losses as well. Um, but thinking about the, in, the different kind of influence that Walter had on me from, from others, and I went back and I, and I looked at the exams that I wrote. I was his last, I was his last graduate student, technically, uh, in the sense that I took a doctoral exam with him um, in late August, early September of 1996. And, um, and, uh, and then he technically was on my committee um, post posthumously, uh, and I didn't finish until 2013. That's a longer story. <laughs> but um, w Walter, um, so Walter had, had not succeeded in going to Congress in 1994, and, um, and I had come to, to meet him and to work my way into doing an exam with him, and, and in the middle of that, but he was clearly going to be running again, and um, in, in the middle of that was, of course, this horrible car accident um, that Walter and Lois were in. I'm now hearing that it was on the day of Sarah Taylor's dissertation prospectus defense. Sarah, where are you? You're somewhere here. Um, and and that, um, that grounded him for, for many months. But it also gave me the opportunity to go over the house. Everybody talks about going over to their house. Um, it gave me the opportunity to go over the house a lot. And we studied together. We studied together the material for my exams. Um, and that's where we started reading um, together the work of, of Václav Havel and Jan Patochka. Um, and uh, I had the opportunity to uh, get to know um, Walter and Lois's daughter, Lisa Caps who was a um, rising star in psychology, was working with Eleanor Oakes at UCLA, and was writing about narration of self in her own work. I think she had worked with autistic um, kids in her own research and, and understanding the formation of self. And, um, and, uh, and, and her loss later was, was, was just heartbreaking. Um, but in that moment, it was, it was amazing to, you know, to see Walter collaborating with Lisa in this work. We were trying to dig up the writing she did on Havel as well, because he looped her into that. Um, and really, I talked a little bit about this yesterday briefly, um, really what was going on was the notion, and I'm thinking about this as a phenomenology of empathy. Um, uh, Lisa, uh, yesterday, or the day before, Julie Ingersoll, another one of Walter's students, um, who also had a strong connection to the house, <laughs> um, talked about making the strange familiar and the familiar strange as the part of the ethos of religious studies at UC Santa Barbara. I think that's really true. But um, if from Clark Roof, we spent a lot of time figuring out what I was gonna study, and Mark Jurgensmeyer, who is still a, um, a conversation partner, especially these days um, with, the, with the crisis, um, we were sort of understanding the way people talk to each other or what they're talking about. With Walter, it was the why. And I went back and I looked at the exams that I took with him and I just, I was so struck at how what I wrote about for him has continued to be a thread of how I do what I do and why I do what I do. Not the what, not the sort of, statistical methodology or ethnographic methodology, but literally the underpinning of the relationship between, among human beings, between human beings, and how we honor one another. And, and that has, I mean, it's just, 
it was stunning to me to see that. And I, and I think it's a phenomenology of empathy for him. Um, and I, I see it in Lois's congressional career. I see it in Laura's career. I see it in Todd's work. I mean, it's, it just shines through the, what, the way the family lives its life and serves the community. Um, and I think it's shot through all of us. I mean, last thing I'll say on this, like, light bulbs go off, right? Ed Linenthal, where's Ed? You know, Ed has spent his career, um, the, the work on the, the Holocaust Memorial Museum, the work on, on the Oklahoma City, the work on, it's, it's engaging with, with survivors in conversation with survivors and the people who perished. I don't want to call them victims because that's a very complicated word. Um, the work, the, the, the unfinished nature of all of this, but again, running through that, is the notion that we have to, we have to do more than listen. We, we have to be bound in some form by our obligation to the people whose voices are not fully heard, who should be heard more in the way that we then go about f understanding the situation or you know, in the government sphere making the decisions that, that, that we have to make. I'm gonna stop there. You know, I, I've, I've just been, um, I mean, hearing all of this, I, um, my relationship with, with Walter, it, it's, uh, again, was a very, um, it's very subtle compared to a lot of the people who are reminiscing about him. Again, I was, um, I was an observer of him more than an interactor of him. I, I, at, you know, 19 years old or whenever it was when I met, met him. I was taken by s such, s you know, the small things about him, you know, his, his wit and his ease and his grace um, and, you know, this sort of smoldering intellect that was sort of hidden underneath a kind of unassuming approach to things. And it's really hard to sort of quantify the impact, but I'll, I, to, to build off of the story that I told about coming here without much of an educational background and 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 just exploring who I was and, and thinking for the first time. I, I'd taken a, several classes or a few classes with him and never interacted with him. I sat in the middle of the class or the back of the class or whatever it is and and that was the extent of it. And one day I got a paper back from him and my the papers that I wrote by the way I, again, because I was not I, I was not a rote learner, I was not a you know, I, I realized that what I could do, I was just starting to develop a voice as a writer. I could write these papers, and I could incorporate things about myself, and and, um, and they weren't so academic. They were they were more re revealing kind of papers, you know, where I was exploring things. So anyway, I get this paper back from him and it says, please come see me in my office hours, right? So I go to see him and he says, you know, I noticed that you've taken a few classes and we haven't really gotten to know one another and I just wanted you to know um, that you have a very interesting mind, right? And for me, it was, you know, like this epic thing that nobody had ever singled me out as being, you know, intellectually interesting or ha having much to say about anything. And so for me, it was a moment of, of sort of infinite possibilities um, out of just that one interaction. Um, and then, uh, by the way, he undercut it with, of course you can't spell worth a damn, is what he said. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I, I in, in looking back there is a there is a thread there is a a, li a direct line to the things that i have have informed my writing um you know i'm sort of a one issue candidate about a couple of things you know i have like i have like one thing that i do over and over again with about interconnectivity and and um and this idea of hope becoming a and the hope was a huge as we all know was a huge word that was unpacked in many, many ways through the multiple classes that I took. Um, and, but this concept of hope that I'd never really 
ever thought about before of, uh, as a tool, as a kind of almost a weapon for positive change in the world. That's something that clearly has impacted uh, the, the stuff that I've pursued as a writer. Can, can I ask you to expand on that? Because I was, I was reflecting on... I, I, I think I watched every episode of Heroes and Heroes Reborn, um, but I also watched Treadstone, and I also watched the show, which I'm blanking on the name, about the, the, the murder in Jerusalem. Dig. Uh, Dig. Uh, and we were talking about Touch yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly, in, I'm thinking about the characters of Noah Bennett and the character of Sylar. And, and in Treadstone, these, these agents who'd been brainwashed, and I think... Um, also under running through your narrative your character building are of people who whom they've tried to break or who have been through breaking uh, profound breaking and who find wholeness I mean you even redeem your villain in heroes right so yeah, it's not I'll, just hope it's I, also yeah that I, don't, sense of I don't know how, how much I can really say other than I, I'm very fascinated by the questions of of, of characters that are pursuing w their, their purpose in life, their meaning, their goal. Destiny is a big part of, you know, and finding your purpose, finding your, and part of that is about becoming a whole. And so characters that start off broken, it's a jigsaw puzzle for me to figure out how to make, make them whole, so. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, First of all, one of the things you touched upon in terms of your earlier political career or, you know, helping start the campaign, and he's going to comment later, it made me think of Reza in Walter Capps' campaigning and the, the Volkswagen bug. And <laughs> but when you were describing your experience, I was seeing a parallel, and I thought that was really interesting. But um, I'll save, let's Reza tell his story. And also, even my husband, we have an old Walter Capps um, campaign, elect Walter Capps t-shirt that my husband still wears to this day. It's getting ratty, but we cannot throw it away. <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that because th those were some good fond memories. And um, I definitely was influenced by just how Reza was affected um, by this family in the home. And it always made me smile. And I was very close to Reza at the time. And I think I was Reza's boss at one point <laughs> in admissions. Um, so I just wanted to comment on that, but I'll let him tell his own story. Um, I think about, so I, I'd mentioned in my story, and it was, it's relevant, that I hated history in high school. That was my downfall. And what was so wonderful about coming to a research institution, going to college, is rediscovering what history really is and not taking a traditional history course. And I think you know, taking the Vietnam course reintroduced and made me understand, appreciate, I'm not gonna say love, but <laughs> um, just this deeper connection to what history is about when it has a context. I felt like in high school I was being fed, you know, excuse the, the term, but you know, old white guys conquering and memorizing dates with my mind and mixing numbers that didn't that didn't do anything for me. And I would say that Vietnam course helped me ground me in the importance of context and what was going on at the time and being able to, to focus on something, focus on the, on the stories of these folks who had these experiences and then being able to read about it and make sense in my mind what had just happened and definitely solidify for me in my head, that war is not the answer. That's what I got from it. And I still live to that, to this, this day about that. Whether it's idealistic or not, that's just how it affected me. Um, I took also women in American history, because I now was brave enough to, and I had to take history courses, you have to, to graduate. So it, it helped, um, it helped make me feel more comfortable entering into the realm of study, studying what has happened in the past and how we have reacted and seeing it from different angles. And I thought he just did a really nice job for me, influencing me to be able to look at what has happened in our past in a different way. And permission that it's not just one way of looking at things. 
There are so, you know, people are affected differently. People play parts in history differently. Um, it just opened that lens, bright, widened my lens. And now I can even read, I, I love to read. And in fact, um, you know, I try to read at least a book a month and I remember, you know, only fiction and now I've definitely gotten more into autobiographies and I love historical fiction. And I think because of some of the training that I got in that class of being able to look at it differently, it has helped me immensely in seeing the world differently. It, 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 listening to you, I'm, I'm reflecting on some of the work that I've done since, particularly in government, um, which I would mention because I, it's obviously so important to um, uh, the legacy, Walter's legacy and Walter's family's legacy. Um, you know, Lois spent her career in Congress lifting up the voices of people who hadn't been lifted up. I'm thinking of nurses. Um, you know, legislation that that provided for support for nursing in this country that had not been previously acknowledged. Um, and, uh, um, you know, Laura is tackling, you know, the challenges here. County government's the best, it's the best job, it's the best job. Um, because you, you, you are at the intersection of everything. Um, and, and Laura is now tackling, right, these, these um, mind-bending uh, issues around, um, around housing and around how we literally keep our, um, our, our environment safe in an era of, of climate change. Um, and uh, one of the things that has come up for me, I, I'm not in elected politics, I, I, I have the greatest of respect for those who can do that. Um, I've been in appointed politics and thinking back, um, on the work that I've been able to do, a lot of it has involved making sure that um, voices that were not heard in the process were being heard. Back in 2017 on the Social Services Commission, I tried to hold hearings on how we could support um, people who feared deportation because it was, you know, if you remember the days of um, instant isolationism under the Trump regime, um, and, uh, and people who were um, immigrants, mixed status homes, um, were deeply, I mean, we are still dealing with the trauma of that, of that moment in our history. Um, and I was told to stay in my lane, and I said, no, I'm not gonna stay in my lane. We had stu co college students um, facing, as you said, right, housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, people trying to build a shelter, um, some of the earliest shelters for college students um, because there wasn't enough housing and it, what there was was unaffordable and kind of not staying in our lane to be able to, 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 get, that, to get that supported um, on the Quality and Productivity Commission, which this is the link back to my White House internship because I was on reinventing government and now I've got to spend, the, I've, I've been able to spend the last 10 years on this really little known county commission that funds and rewards innovation in government and we have spent a lot of time making sure that when projects come to us, they are not just for the people they serve, but they are with the people they serve. And they reflect those vo that those voices are not just heard, but they are present in the work that we are doing. Um, and some of that can get into the fine grain, right? Some of that is really detailed. It's it's got, you know it's, it's in the the words of the legislation or the or the way that the program is developed. Um, and when I finished being chair of the Quality and Productivity Commission, and I had and and there was this moment, and I, this is not a brag. I, I I don't like to share these as there was this moment where I was up in front of the board of supervisors and Supervisor Sheila Kuehl, who's um, a true hero uh, in this work, was describing what I had done and then she flipped the script and she said what I had done was build trust in government. And save the cheerleader, save the world. There is a moment where, and I think this is part of Walter's genius, where we make the connection between hearing and honoring a voice. And when we hear and honoring, but this is what, this is the point that Sheila was making when she, this was not about me, this was about, this was to the, this was the end of 2019 when trust in government was really low, right, still is. The point was when we actually listen to one another, when we actually bring the voices of the unheard 
into the conversation. That is how we do the Tocquevillian, Havelian, um, big picture, godly work, right? I mean, this is, there's a level of transcendence here of restoring the bonds between the people and the government that we are, it's supposed to be by, for, and with all of us, right? So there's that local to global, right? Which is why I said what I said about the cheerleader in the world. And Walter, Walter made that connection. He made that connection real and he made that connection urgent. Um, you know, I, there's a, there's a, to drill down on that, just in the, in the way that, um, and this goes back to the impact that he had on me. Um, I took a couple of classes that, in my memory, uh, they were very small, I don't, can't remember how many, but they were, you know, very small classes, and we get, had a chance to, and they were very Socratically taught. There was a lot of group discussion, and um, I just kind of wanted to go back a little, because I think that some of that DNA of what you're talking about is, is built, not just empathy, but generosity. The idea of, of um, I was very struck by, uh, and, and, and I, I lead, you know, writers' rooms that are creative, you know, think tank kind of environments. And I, I don't know that I consciously think about Walter, but I definitely am influenced by his approach to pulling the best out of people. Um, that there was a sort of a, and I, I just, I, I sort of define it as a generosity, a, um, a bigness. He was, he was very big, he loomed very large, without, sometimes being big is being the, the least talkative in the room, right? Is sometimes it's saying the least and letting, you know, letting the, other, letting the others have their moment. And that's something that I think was enormously um, impactful for me and, and really gets to, I think the logical extension is what you were talking about, but in the smaller microcosm of seven people sitting around, or it, you could see the, the seeds of, of that. Um, the other thing I'd like to sort of steer this a tiny bit to is the, the sense of humor and the, the, the silliness, you know, if there, was a, if there was a joke to be had, he would lean in that direction, you know, he'd go, he'd go out of his way to find the joke. And um, just, I want to get just a uh, just quick, uh, uh, tell a, a quick story about a, a memory that I have of him coming in one day and starting the lecture by saying, um, I just want to tell everybody that I had notes and they were really great notes and everything was really, it was, was going to be a, you know, Academy Award winning performance, but, but my dog uh, destroyed the notes or ate the notes or something. Was, somehow the notes were destroyed by the dog. And that's how he started the lecture, right? And so about 10 or 15 minutes into the lecture, the dog becomes a character in the lecture, right? And he weaves the idea of the dog and the dog destroying the notes. And suddenly you realized, and I forget what the subject was, but you realized that he was using this story as a metaphor to explain what it is that he was trying to, and you watched through the class like a wave as everybody got it, right? <laughs> and the light bulb and people was suddenly looking at each other and afterwards people talking and, you know, on the way out of the class, do you think the dog really ate the notes? And, you know, <laughs> but it was just such a, it was, it was sort of like, it was sort of like jazz, like jazz, you know. It's kind of like a free, free like a jazz musician, um, and I just remember that it was all. But it was there was a twinkle in his eye about the whole idea of it. He was, whether he was coming up with it, you know, extemporaneously or it, it had all been planned. I'm not sure, but it was, it was a moment of of real brilliance. That's beautiful. I don't. I, I believe that he, he had some humor. I think what I remember is more warmth. And, um, you know, at, in thinking about this, it reminded me of the Maya Angelou 
quote, it's not, I'm not saying this verbatim, but you know, it's not what someone says, it's how they make you feel. And so that, that's what really um, was important to me in that classroom. So, and I, and I bet that happened a lot. It was a long time ago, y'all. Like, and I'm probably not, I know I'm not the oldest person in this room. <laughs> but um, I just, it's the warmth. And that's what I really remember about the classroom. What about you? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, Tim said something that reminded me, I think, and this goes back to this, this notion of the, the what and the why in, in my own thinking and learning and um, Walter the other thing about the exams that I that I wrote for him is the experience of working with him was about pulling from me what was me right it wasn't yeah. he wasn't the teacher who brought in some other theory and blew your mind because you know, you were going to now see the world in a whole new light. It was, he was showing you something that was there all along, in yourself and in people around you and in the ideas that you were swimming in. And, um, and that's, very, that's very powerful. It's a, you said pulling out of you. And I, you know, like it, he was, he could see, he, we, we felt seen, I think. Um, and I think he also had, thought it was, in some way, you know, terribly funny to like the professor running for Congress. That was, I mean, I think he kind of got a kick out of that. Um, he, he did tell, I, I did, we did have one kind of exchange early on. It, Havel came to Congress and I, I don't think Walter was on the foreign, was Walter on the Foreign Affairs Committee? I don't think he, was he? But he was a junior member. There was, it was some issue that Havel was coming and Walter wanted to get into the meeting with Havel because he had written about Havel. And um, he got to go, and it was a seminar. It became, you know, all of these politicians who wanted to do the political thing with the president of the Czech Republic. And Walter was like, this is Václav Havel, people. <laughs> right? like, this is big ideas. <laughs> and just the, the joy of that. Um, and it was a little bit of a, it was a little bit of a, yeah, we can, we can have a seminar in Congress. We can have a Walter Capps class on Capitol Hill. That is allowed, people. <laughs> yeah, I do remember being in, a, in the undergraduate feeling really far from politics, really far. I wasn't a poli-sci major. I didn't know much about the government. You know, it, we didn't have social media back then, so it wasn't, you know, in my feed talking about it. So it was pretty fascinating to watch him go through, you know, running for government, not winning, and then doing it again. It, it got me a lot more interested. I became more informed just because it's like, oh my gosh, that's my professor. What is he doing? What does this mean? What does politics look like? So I think that was a really interesting thing for all of us at UCSB who maybe had not really paid attention to what government looks like or how you enter it. To watch him do that, that was pretty fascinating. You know, I... I remember it was year, you know, years after I'd taken classes from him when I found out that he was running. And, and at first it was like, what? Why? You know, how? And then as I thought about it, you realize how much sense it made and the shape of his, his arc. You know, the ideas that he had been teaching, the ideals and the concepts and, the, and now finally being able to put those to use in... In for the public good was a real trajectory that I think made a lot of sense. And when you really looked at it from afar, you realized, boy, this is kind of what the founding fathers really wanted. You know, they wanted people who were who were big thinkers and and accomplished people at a certain point in their life when they've done this much and achieved it. Then they go and serve their country and. You know, it wasn't this idea of doing it from the as a vocation from the beginning of your life. You know, you were you were to do that when you actually had something to offer. And I thought there was a real beauty to the shape of how he built the arc of that for himself. Well, it's interesting because it's almost like well, almost like a dare. Like, well, you know so much. Well, yeah, I do. I can do this. And it was great demonstration of yeah, I can do this. I can actually be of service in this way as well. And the number of people who are inspired by that. Yeah. 
yeah. irrespective of the outcome, right? The value of it was not, this was not the, the, the value of it was obviously Walter in Congress, but the value of it was also what you just said. It was the number of people who, when he was running or when he was in Congress or years later, people I would talk to who remembered the campaign in Los Angeles, around the country, around the world even, people who were inspired by that very idea of someone as smart and as caring and as ethical and as humane as Walter was, bringing his voice to be one of those, you know, 535, and, um, and yeah, that's what government should be. I mean, how far we have fallen. We could use some of his lessons yeah. moving forward. Yeah, he, he stood out then, but man, would he stand out now. I know, yeah. Um, so when I was asked to be on this panel, I was thinking, well, why me? You know, I didn't have a strong relationship with him. I was, you know, that scared little undergraduate sitting probably right over there, just trying to keep up taking notes, having my mo mind blown. But I, I'm, sh I'm sure I, I've met him several times. I was in his class, but he didn't know me super well, if at all. And um, so I was really like, why are they asking me? And then it occurred to me that, oh, well, I guess I have a relationship with the CAP Center. And um, I've certainly lived my life in service, which I think is a lasting impression that he left on me. And I teach this little class called Civic Engagement Scholarship. <laughs> and um, Laura was just in our class presenting. And she was amazing. Um, and this class, I just wanted to share a little bit about this class and, and seeing maybe the really strong connection and how cool it is to be sitting up here and thinking about hopefully living a little bit of his legacy um, is this class that uh, a colleague and I, well, actually worked with a third colleague that worked for the CAP Center, and it was her idea, but she ended up leaving the university, and Viviana Marsano in my office, who is um, our civic engagement person, she has a long title, but that's besides the point, um, she and I, <laughs> Ran, have run with this class, and that's the third year we're teaching it. It's a year-long class. It, it rests in religious studies. It's civic engagement scholars, and the concept is the fall quarter, we teach what civic engagement is. And we have definitely learned that students, they'll think it's voting, and you're done. You've done your civic engagement. So we're really trying to tease it out to really understand where their place could be and imagine and we have lots of guest speakers. Um, Ethan here from um, Isla Vista Community Service District. We have founders of the, the, uh, cervic, um, the district come and speak to our class and talk about how as students and recent alums, how they created the Community Service District. Um, we have uh, our uh, representative of the uh, supervisor, from the board, Laura has come. We had Joan Hartman a couple of years ago when she was a representative. We start with Dick Flax, who talks about the history of activism in this area, and he zooms in, and I always warn the class, now it's gonna feel like you know this old white man is just talking at you, but pay attention, and by the time he's done talking, they have so many questions, they're so excited, their minds are blown. Um, we have a lot of nonprofits come and present. So we spend, and in between, I do a lot of leadership development with, uh, with them. Mark, Viviana does a lot of constructive dialogues. We have Professor Tanya Israel talk about difficult conversations. So we're really trying to prepare them for the next step, which is to actually have a project um, for the winter and spring quarters. And it, it's about sharing stories. It's about talking the different ways of getting involved. We have school teachers come and talk about mentoring youth. You know, we really try to expand their mind and see where their special place in civic engagement rests. And, and a lot of that really does come from, a, Viviana Marsano has her degree in history from UCSB. She's from Argentina and um, knew Walter Capps. And so we definitely, have been influenced and are trying to leave a, uh, lead a piece of his legacy through uh, the class and get these students engaged. We need them so badly 
to want to make a difference, to get involved, to be leaders, to figure out where their special place is. And that's something that I definitely gained from Walter's class going forward. So I'm curious, you know, continue that conversation. How has that landed you where you are today and you see strands of his legacy in your work? I, I think it's so important that people can see themselves in, in the work of, of holding the, the civic community, right? I mean, one of the, one of the, the, the biggest challenges is people, as you say, right, um, thinking that it starts and ends with voting, right? And um, just, I've done work in the past, we, we, we created a program that, that won a democracy prize um, that focused on encouraging diverse service on boards and commissions in Los Angeles. We recruited from across multiple faiths and ethnicities to come to this training because we wanted to do two things. We wanted to both diversify who is on these boards and commissions. There are so many structural barriers to service right now. I mean, childcare, you know, people who can't, or, or elder care, that can't afford to take time off from work or can't leave somebody alone because the the commission meets from 10 to 12, or it meets from five to seven, right? Um, people who think that they're not qualified because they don't have a college degree, they don't look like the people whose photos are on the wall, um, they need to be able to see themselves in this work, number one. And number two, um, what do we do, and this is you know, getting worse and worse by the day, when folks come in to try to break that down? to disrupt the work of government, to bring a level of hate or vi even violence, right? I mean, uh, that we saw, um, I mean, if, if, I think it would have been hard, I think it was, Walter had a big heart. I, I don't know how he would have, I, I don't, I mean, what January 6th did to all of us, right? Like, I would have, we needed him in that moment, right? Um, to, to bring us back together. But people who are doing this work, and this is work at the county level or the city level that is about building equity, that it's about building dig dignity, and they're getting disrupted by those who don't want those things for others. And so how do we do that work? How do we do that work of bringing people into the process, um, showing them that they have a voice, that they have a role to play, and making that space? Um, and I'm very much aware of how I present in the world and what I look like and how old I am and what my background is. And I feel that it is absolutely vital um, to broaden who is at the table and to be a voice of broadening, right? That is the, you know, if we talk about checking our privilege or, or doing that work, checking my privileges means that, I, checking my privilege means that I need to be a voice for broadening and to make sure that we're always doing that work and not just taking it for granted that I'm sitting at the table. And I think that's what Walter did every day with the courses that he taught was to bring, we were just, I think Julie made this observation yesterday, it might have been Sarah, that going back to the work, the Walter's writings from the 1970s and the 1980s, they are as, they read fresh today, right? The times were different, but his openness, his concern for the dignity of those who were different from him, those who look different from him, but from, with whom he could find common ground, those are the, um, that, that spirit was with Walter from the beginning, and, um, and he's a model in that sense for the, this, the work of broadening what the civic commons can be. You know, I'm seeing a, a, a lot of, as you're talking about this, I'm seeing a lot of DNA of what I have been trying to do as a storyteller in all of this, this idea of bringing people into the process. You know, I, just to sort of jump to the punchline of, of where my, my arc of my, I, I, you know, I started off as a, in traditional in traditional television is a one-way street idea of relationship with the people who are watching or consuming your content you make it and push it out into the world and they consume it and you have no relationship with them and all that obviously changed with the internet and um, and and suddenly that 
one-way street could become a two-way street. You had a very dynamic relationship with, the, with, with an audience. And I became fascinated in that idea that the audience actually could interact with the content and with the story and become a part of the story. Um, so, you know, the big hero, uh, heroes fan base that would suddenly could find one another and interact and, and form groups and, and all of that. I tried to take it to the next logical conclusion. And again, the through line of all of this is that I think there is a th thread that goes all the way back to, the, to, to, to Walter and what he, what he taught. Um, the logical conclusion of the, this sort of interactive relationship with a with with an audience was um, I started to explore the idea of multi-platform storytelling to, to, uh, stories that take place on on these devices that we all carry in our pockets and and these devices are not just a consumption content consumption device they're a content creation device they know where you are they know where your friends are they've got uh, you know all of man's knowledge at the couple of clicks away and so how could you now engage an audience to become actually participants in this narrative, right? And so, so I explored this whole idea. I did a, a big project called Conspiracy for Good, which explored the idea of people becoming uh, characters within a narrative, um, and then ultimately having real positive results come out of it. So it, it ostensibly was a giant scavenger hunt using mobile phones on the streets of London. And, and, uh, uh, but but it, was, um, it was done for Nokia, uh, the big cell phone manufacturer, who at the time had about 75% of the market share for handsets in the world. And, um, but anyway, as a result of this narrative that we had people running all over the place and telling story and on online and in social games and mobile games. We, um, we built and stocked uh, five libraries in Africa and we gave, you know, um, 50 scholarships away to schoolgirls and donated 10,000 books. And the, it sort of proving out this idea that you could create a narrative where people could, could participate inside of and then have positive results happen as a result of it. And that's where the coined the, the, I, the, the term social benefit storytelling. That's fascinating. Uh, one thing I, I just wanted to insert, I forgot to finish that we had received a we have received a grant this last three years from the UC National Free Speech and Civic Engagement Center. And um, I can't help to think of how important it is that we have a center like that to remind us how, the importance of civic engagement. But um, I'm wondering what other stories that you might have that you'd wanna share that we haven't touched upon or any questions that you have. And then maybe we could go to the audience and see what they're thinking. Uh, I'm just gonna tell a quick, a quick story just because yeah, it's apropos of nothing. It's just a, we a, a memory, just a memory. I went, um, I took a, monastic, a class on monasticism and uh, um, and uh, Walter took about, I must have been five or six of us, I think, up to the uh, Immaculate Heart Hermitage up in near Big Sur and uh, on a silent retreat, right? And we were supposed to be silent for the, you know, the week that we were there. And we took it really seriously, you know, we all took it very seriously. And um, we weren't the only ones there. Uh, there were other retreat, you know, other people on retreat. One of them was... Uh, Gregory, Gregory Bateson, the, the British renowned anthropologist and married to Margaret Mead. He was, a, he was, on the re, he was one of the regents of the University of Calif California at the time. And so we knew that he was there and there were other people that were, you know, kind of, kind of there. But we all took our, our, our vows of silence pretty, pretty seriously. And one day we, I was walking out to this lookout that looks out over the ocean and I, you know, ran into Walter and we did the, you know, the sort of nod to one another like we were, you know, and we walked together in silence and went out to the end of this lookout and there was um, Gregory Bateson there and it was a warm day and he had his shirt off and he was absolutely pasty, pale, glowing white, you know, just, and, um, 
we all sort of stood together looking out of it. And, uh, and then Walter and I turned and walk, started walking back, and he sort of leaned over to me and said in this kind of mock Brit British accent, only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. <laughs> And like I said, it's apropos of nothing. It's just a memory. And it's just Great story. <laughs> I, I, he had to get a little zinger in there. Zinger. <laughs> they went back to being silent. Yeah, that's right. right. I, I want to I go out to the audience. I mean, I want to I hear from the audience, but can, I don't know if we can have the lights up for a minute because we, you know, I, I would love to just see how many of Walter's students are in the room. If you actually, stand up if you were, a student of Walter Capps, if you actually, if he gave you a grade, wow. you know. <laughs> um, wow, yeah. So I mean, this is this is our community, and I'm gonna, and and uh, by way of going to the students, I'm. This is a weird connection. Where's Mike Madrid? Where are you, Mike? You're right there. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I I I see Mike, and I see Shad, and I see, um, and I see who else. Uh, so many, so many people, I'm just gonna name those, those names. I, I'm thinking about the communities that formed immediately after Walter's passing. I was, Clark hired me on to be, um, I was the first CAPS fellow and um, a junior, junior fellow, something like that. Um, and we put on this conference right away in 1999, I think it was Casa de Maria, um, thanks to Sarah Miller McCune, uh, and um, immediately, the community came together, and it was, and and I want to stress this notion um, that from the get-go, the legacy of Walter Capps for all of us, with those who had been with him, right, as um, as as co-teachers, as co. Uh, designers, people who had been his students, people who were part of the Santa Barbara community, um, were it was it was it was clear that this was a shared legacy. So often, and this is, and then I want to hear from people in the room. So often, in the tradition of an academic, right, the you think about the legacy as being owned by their students or their colleagues. Um, and so the legacy kind of sits off up here and we think about the intellectual genealogy of their ideas led to so-and-so's ideas and just our conversation is about, the, is about a, is the humanity of it, right? And it's about, and what is the, how does that humanity express itself? It's in the fact that all of us, whether we were veterans, right? Whether, whether, we, were, whether we were strangers, uh, to use the voices of the strangers metaphor, right? Whether we were undergraduate students, graduate students, whether we were Lois and Todd and Laura's and Lisa's neighbors, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, um, in, in, in Santa Barbara, whether we were people who knew of the Caps family, but we were in Santa Barbara um, as, as fellow residents, as fellow citizens, as fellow stakeholders in our democracy, people around the world who benefited from his work on the state humanities councils, and we heard from them yesterday, there is a extraordinary co-ownership of this legacy um, that I think is truly unique and deserves celebration. Uh, and I'm, I'm really glad that we've had these, we will continue to have these, um, this, this day, these few days, but I'm just so struck by all of that co-ownership, right? All of that co, I mean like, Walter belongs to all of us. We all belong to Walter in some sense. Um, and it is not in one sector or another. And that's part of what makes the legacy so powerful. Here, here. It definitely um, strikes me of how important this conference is for us to continue living the memories and moving us forward. Because we have a lot of work to do and we need people to continue to be engaged in civic engagement, to continue living the legacy of Walter. And I would love to hear if anybody first has any questions for us. Ooh, and then we'll have statements. And I'm gonna start with Reza with the statements, but we'll start with questions first. The microphone's hot here. Looks like Hello? it. Hello? Yes. yes, hi. Um, I'm Amanda Green, I teach philosophy here at UCSB. And um, the title of this panel was um, 
uh, teaching ethics and civic values, I think. And I'm just, as of yesterday, learning about Walter Capps, and it strikes me that he was a teacher of ethics. But he also wasn't really a teacher of ethics in the way that we would say that in the philosophy department, <laughs> like ethical theory and the different ways of thinking about what it is to live a virtuous life, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted to pose a question to each of you. Uh, what do you think it is to teach ethics? What did you learn from Walter Capps about teaching ethics? And I, I want to include the filmmaker here. I think you, you probably are a teacher of ethics. So please don't exclude yourself from answering. But could you, could you reflect briefly on what it was to teach ethics for Walter and, and what it is for you and how you were shaped by that? Thanks. I mean, my, my exam was on ethics, <laughs> among other things. So I mean, yes, we actually did, we cover, I mean, we were, we were reading Habermas and, and um, right, so the question of, of um, the question of ethics and communication, the question of, of um, I was looking over my exams, I'm not gonna sort of <laughs> read them off, but um, that we were dealing with that, right? And that's part of what I said comes back to me because I ended up, um, my whole dissertation was an, an intersubjective definition of religion, understanding that what, where do we see religion as scholars of religion, it's well, we, Tim and I have a conversation. If we find we're talking about the same thing and it's intelligible to Katya, then Katya can write about it. And right, but if Tim doesn't understand me and I don't understand Tim, and Katya's looking at us and saying, "You all don't make any sense. How you can't make sense of it." And so there's there, there's an ethical dilemma of even the act of defining something from from an observer standpoint. So we did we did explore those questions. I think. Um, what I would say is that we spent more time on the intersubjective. We spent more time on communication ethics. We spent more time on, um, and I alluded to this. Um, I alluded to this earlier. Uh, you know, what was the value-based ethics as opposed to outcome-based ethics, right? Um, virtue-based ethics was the, and it goes back to his campaign, was the, was the value of his campaign in the running or was the value of his campaign in the winning, right? And um, that's where we talked about it. And I think, I, I would say, I think that's largely been lost in the current American political system. Um, I'd love to see more of it coming back, uh, but it was very much on, very much on his mind. And I think part of what this notion of pulling us out of ourselves um, was Walter saying intellectually, you know, the stuff that animates you, the questions that you're asking me, there's a whole intellectual tradition of people who were asking the same questions. Let's go talk to them and see how the questions they were asking and the way they were answering it relate to the way you're asking and answering those questions. And that was very, that was very powerful. So I think the teaching of the, to, to answer your question, I think, how it influences teaching ethics is, for me, the ethics are when I'm in a, when I'm in a government setting, okay, and we're dealing with a problem, I am very concerned to make sure that anyone who wants to be heard on the matter gets heard. And not that I necessarily agree with them, but for me, the moment of sort of ethical, the ethical standard that has to be reached is that we listened, that we listened to the person that we acknowledged what they were saying, even if ultimately we're not able to, in the context of a land use decision, say, oh yeah, sure, we, you know, the number of people who come in and say, you can't build housing here or here because X, Y, Z, right? Um, I, I wanna hear what they have to say. I disagree, we're gonna build that housing. But the ethics of that decision-making process are rooted in the fact that we hear them, we acknowledge them, we try to address the underlying issue. If that's they don't like people, can't help them. But if it's that there's a problem they want solved, the ethics are that we make a good faith effort to try to solve that problem and then do the thing that we are you know, called upon either legally or morally to do. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Tim, do you wanna um, go? Yeah, uh, so, so the, you know, the, the classes that I took from Walter were, you know, um, I uh, took class on Thomas Merton, um, 
class on monasticism, took a class on action theology. I, I don't, I'm not sure what it was called, but it, it was about that. And, and the big takeaway for me, the through line of all of it, was the, the spiritual um, beliefs that drive, um, that drive positive action, that drive people towards what, what are the foundations that create the basis for how you act in the world and how you, how you act in a positive way in the world. And, um, you know, it's so baked into the DNA of, of what, how I write. I mean, a character is action. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not really about what you say, it's what you do and what your actions are. And so I think, you know, I, I think that I somehow have pulled f from that, um, you know, from these classes that I took with, with Walter, this, this idea that, that your core beliefs and your actions are connected to one another. And, and I've, that's, the, that's been the thing that I've explored the most in my writing. For me, to be clear, I teach two classes here at UCSB, but I am a practitioner. I am not a professor. I'm reminded of that by faculty often, so I just want to be clear about that. Maybe that's a little bit of my imposter syndrome. Um, the thing for me was the modeling. The modeling of making, doing the right thing. You're going to make mistakes. Things are going to happen. And I saw that modeling with the way, against the warmth of Walter and the way he set up his class in providing the voice of others and that belonging piece. And so that's what's very important to me in my classes and with the students that I work with daily. In our civic engagement class, we ask our students to do research on the folks who are the speakers and to think about ethics and, and to think about, you know, how are they doing the right thing? What does service mean? In my leadership class, we actually talk specifically about ethical leadership and get them to, them to think about that and even pose a case study. And so how would you approach this particular problem? And for them to be thinking in different ways, the different lenses that I talked about earlier that actually helped me feel that I belonged here at UCSB. And so I think ethics is the modeling, the asking critical questions, that critical thinking piece, and getting them to recognize. It is, it's kind of like understanding policy. Like, we make a decision to do this, just like you talked about housing. So how does it affect people, all people, about where you're gonna build that housing? And so teaching that and provi um, providing those uh, opportunities for the students to think through all the different ways to approach the problem, right? And so that, my experience in Walter's class was the first time I started thinking critically about, oh wow, you know, the, these people have different opinions, different experiences, you know, someone might have had, have this identity or have had this experience. Where is the judgment? They're human. You know, where was the decision making in terms of how they got to where they were or what their cultural background is, um, where the ethnic background is. So I just try to play that forward in my classes and, and provide the opportunity for students to think about it and not just judge or, you know, get them to ask why do we make particular decisions and who does it benefit. I just add really quickly that. Ba um, you know, my list had Bachtin and Bauman on it, right? Which in the mid 90s, Walter was thinking about um, mechanization, right? The bu bureaucracy, he was also thinking about commodification in this post war, post Cold War moment. And, um, and I think that's a constant question. I think it's an ethical question of what does it mean to be human in the face of commodification, in the face of mechanization and bureaucratization, and how do you maintain human connection? Buber came up yesterday, right? How do you maintain those connections? Um, and those are ethical questions. Okay, so we have a, quite a line over here, but we're gonna start with Reza. Um, and Reza, I'd love to hear from you, your connection. Thank you, thank you so much. Great to be home. First of all, all of you watching are wonderful speakers. I don't know about you, but I kept picturing Walter right behind that podium. 
<laughs> and uh, often when we had speakers in his class, he would look down, I was always in the front row, and he would just smile and nod when they made some uh, really cool comment, and I kept seeing Walter. I mean, this is Campbell Hall, but for thousands of UCSB alumni, it's really Walter's house, okay? Yeah. And um, I'm so excited that Laura, we talked earlier that we decided to do it, uh, do it here. So my background, I went to UCSB, graduated 1993, had five wonderful years with the greatest boss in the world, um, who to this day still influences me. But I was in the Vietnam class. I got three quick, really funny stories of Walter. Uh, the first one was I was in the Vietnam class, and I decided to go to Washington uh, to see the wall. And it happens to be that of all the people sitting on the plane, I got to sit next to Walter on the five and a half hour flight. So it was just a lucky uh, break. And we spoke and I told him about my life growing up in Iran, in the revolution, escaping the Ayatollah, moving with my mom to India for six years, and coming to America as a 17 year old. And many years later when I worked at UCSB, I spoke in the voice of a stranger class for three years as a voice of a first generation immigrant. So that was uh, the connection we had. But as we talked, we really connected and he, re he whispered to me, he's like, hey, my daughter has an internship at the White House and we have a private tour of the White House. And uh, George Bush Sr. was in Kennedy Bunkport. So while that evening, I got to go to the White House and two of us leaned over the rope into the Oval Office uh, and um, we got to take pictures at the press room. And before we left, Walter goes, oh, excuse me, can I use the restroom? And I said, uh, can I go too? So we started walking towards the restroom. We looked like Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito and twins. You know? <laughs> And he just whispers to me, he's like, I don't really have to pee. I just wanted to tell my friends I got to pee in the White House. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, who is this guy? He's, the, he's my professor. And I kept calling him Dr. Caps. He's like, call me Walter, you know. Um, so years later, I got to work on the campaign with Ben and Tu and, all, and, and, um, and Laura. And um, First Lady Hillary Clinton was coming to, the, yeah. to Santa Barbara to campaign right. for us in Montecito at the old Miramar. Uh -huh. And everybody was excited. Um, and a couple of weeks before, um, the White House advance team said, we need somebody from the campaign to meet her at the airport. And everyone's like, you know, they're like, you're not going to go. You're from Iran. I mean, how are you going to get past security, right? You know? And sure enough, we were in the campaign room downtown. I remember that a two story. And Walter says, you know, I've decided the person who's going to represent our campaign is going to be the person who really understands democracy and he had to escape the Ayatollah, he's like, Reza, you're going to meet the First Lady. So um, I still have the picture in my mom's room. I got to meet First Lady Hillary Clinton and got an amazing picture with her. You know, for me, first generation coming from Iran to get to meet who should have been the president <laughs> was uh, one of the greatest things. And the last story is after we won the campaign the second year, uh, second time, it was about 10 days after the campaign was over. And I had all my cousins and uncles here from LA at, the, at Ledbetter Beach to have a barbecue. And suddenly, just 10 days after the campaign, Walter and Lois showed up to our barbecue. And Walter, and I get teared eyed when I think about this, told my whole family, He's like, if it wasn't for your son, I wouldn't have won this campaign. His work in Isla Vista and uh, in all of us, you know, being Iranian Americans, here's a future congressman coming here, taking time with wonderful Lois to come and say thanks to me. That was, that was his legacy. So thanks for everyone for being here. We're going to do this one time because we did it several times in his campaign. Ole, 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 Walter, Walter. Thank you so much, Katya. Yeah, next. I have a question for you, Katia. Um, I also was a first generation college student and uh, wasn't a particularly good high school student. Uh, no one thought I would go to college. Um, wasn't interested in history, but ended up, um, the humanities or college really just sort of blew my world apart. Uh, the infinite possibility that you talked about. And uh, I did an undergraduate degree, came, uh, got a PhD here in religious studies. Walter was one of my professors. Um, my 30-year academic career, I've, I've seen this sort of increasing corporatization and bureaucratization of higher ed, and I'm kind of interested in your perspective because I think you can give me something of a bird's eye view as somebody who's invested in the humanities but somebody who also works in administration. I'm really worried about the future of higher ed because it seems to me that the rich kids are going to get what we got and the other kids are not going to get that. Um, it's all going to be rubrics and metrics and 
evaluations that ask you at the end of a class what you got out of it. And if we've seen anything over the last two days is that like most of us have no idea even still the, the breadth of influence of Walter and the program in our lives. And I'm wondering what you see, is it, um, is it like that everywhere? Is UCSB as humanities oriented as it was? Is it, are there other, uh, like across the country, is it, are there a lot of places where the humanities are still surviving? And I'd like to hear your perspective on that. Thanks. Yeah. Well, actually I saw David Marshall here. He probably could talk about humanities. <laughs> but um, I, I'll just tell you what I am seeing. I am seeing an attack on higher ed. I am seeing an attack on free expression. Um, the things that have provided access for first generation, for the middle class, for the wealthy. I mean, this is a leveling playing field when we come to the institution. Our, our incoming class is still made, 30, is still made up of 30 to 40% first generation. And so they're still coming and it's so important. But the, the impression that some folks are trying to make is that we don't need higher education anymore. And I think that's something we have to combat. I think we have to talk about belonging. I think we have to talk about the importance of critical thinking. Um, as an undergraduate, especially, and this is something I see every day, it is a chance to to chew on things, to, to imagine, to make mistakes, to write a bad paper and get good feedback, to those, you know, midnight to 2 a.m. conversations in the hallways of the res halls with different experiences, political leanings, um, to, you know, the crazy preacher in, Arbor, in the Arbor area who's saying women should be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen and students having a fit about it. You know, they, they, they'll call me first and say, oh, this, this horrible person. And I come out and students are fascinated and they're having conversations. And I talk about free expression. They don't have to be there to listen. I'm all, but how are you affected? What are you thinking? What, what difference do you want to make about this person screaming these things that you don't agree with? Higher education is, it is a gateway to a future for so many. And, you know, and it's a chance, and, and I get really upset when I, outsiders come and protest something on campus. Our students, they should protest. They should, you know, have horrible speakers on campus and people really be affected and decide, you know, why they don't like that speaker and protest. And the ones that want the speaker should be allowed to have the speaker. I have those conversations with students every single day. But there is this, the they, who is trying to say, see those liberal pansies, whatever they call us, in this ivory tower that doesn't need to exist anymore. And so I think we need to do a better job of talking about the importance of higher education, talking about the legacy of Walter Capps and bringing people to talk to us about real life experience, talk about the strangers, uplifting those voices. And that happens every day on this campus. And it just kills me when, you know, we are defunded you know, when, when I think about we have to have a bake sale just to be able to support a first generation student so they get, you know, basic needs or um, scholarships. So there's a lot there. Um, but it is definitely this idea and it's polar, polarized in terms of the benefit and the importance of higher education. So that's what I'm seeing. Can I just say, I don't know if anybody has seen this. I wish as a former, as an alum, to go to the USEN and to see that etched on the stone of the USEN is an office dedicated to food security. What a failure of a society we are. Let me just say that. That we have to worry on a daily basis about whether or not the students at this university have enough to eat. What are, we're, we're doing something wrong, right? I mean, Lois and Laura have spent their careers trying to figure this out and advocating for the dignity of every single person in this congressional district, in this county, and, and yet the system is, I mean, I was just, I saw that and my heart broke, um, and, 
And that is what we're fighting. We're fighting a system that takes that for granted. And Walter would demand that we never take it for granted any day of the week. Back in the day, we didn't pay tuition. Our students pay tuition now. I just want to be cognizant oh. of the time. Uh, we have three more uh, public speakers here, so we'll, we'll take their comments. And then I want you all to know um, that there is a food truck out front when we're done here. Thank you. Um, Please uh, enjoy some food out front, and then uh, we'll reconvene promptly at 2. We have a full afternoon of programming, so we're going to look forward to the last uh, several public comments and really want to thank our panel. This has been fantastic. Thank you. And thank you, Katya, for uh, steering the ship. Yep, looking at the time. Two more people. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, three or four. Okay. Yeah, I think we can take all four. Lists. Oh, absolutely. We're expeditious, yeah. and okay. then we'll all enjoy lunch. Perfect. And I should add uh, speakers for the session. If it wasn't clear, we're having lunch across the way at Mosher. Uh, so if you're a speaker for the conference, please go there. Perfect. Thank you. Um, my name is Claudia Caution, and I took uh, Walter's class in 1985. The first quarter, it was actually in this room. And I also took his moral, the Rise of the Moral Majority class the following quarter, and um, that was very, I was afraid then, and that was in 1985. So <laughs> now we know where it all ended. But what was important, and it's been touched upon yesterday about his empathy, today it's about his legacy. I um, am an army brat. My father had two tours in Vietnam. And just like Tracy said earlier today, one of the assignments in the uh, Vietnam class is to speak to your parent who was in the war, or in my case, I wrote a letter with a bunch of questions, and I got it back from my father. My mother told me he was very upset when he got the letter. He did not want to answer my questions. And by the end of the letter, I could not read his writing because he was so drunk, because um, he was an alcoholic. My mom says he was a heavy drinker when he went to Vietnam and he came back an alcoholic. So, and he was in his 30s. He was an officer. He had two tours. And, you know, what I learned during the class is I got to understand my father. Even though the major thing that they noted is during World War II, the average age of a military man was 26. It was 19 in Vietnam. And I so remember the group coming back from the pilgrimage. I don't know if that was the first quarter that they did the pilgrimage to Washington, DC. But a young man talked to us about how he found his name among the, well, the names. And he went and he looked at the name on the wall, and the person died. That young man died at the same age as he was, you know, 20 years later. And so it was a very empowering and very important course for me as a daughter of a Vietnam veteran. I got to understand my father better. I then moved on. Your, purpose, your, your reason for uh, this particular panel is like, what did you do beyond? Well, I ended up getting an internship with a project on the Vietnam generation in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1986, and I got to know Jack Wheeler and um, Sandy Foriel, who worked with Jan Scruggs to build the Vietnam Memorial. So that was really special. And then, a few months after that, I got a job on the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs, and, and Senator Cranston, Alan Cranston, was the chair, and so I worked for the next three and a half years helping veterans. Now, mind you, I was a little person on the committee, but I learned about the issues that were affecting veterans. And my father eventually got ill, and he died in a veterans hospital. So I knew a lot of things that were happening, and I understood it better, and I knew the context because of Walter's class. So thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Jeff Greenfield, and I did not take any cast from Walter Capps, but I have one story that Lois and Laura wanted me to tell you. This, you should think I know how to use this. Um, I came out here in 96 during the second campaign. 
to do a piece for Nightline on the campaign and also to get an all-expense paid trip to Santa Barbara. <laughs> so I, I sat down with Walter and after a while I said, I don't understand something. You have this amazing job. You are renowned. You are beloved at a great university. You're in this gorgeous house in one of the most beautiful places to live with a great family. Why, and you are a senior citizen, why would you want at this point in your life to go 3,000 miles away and be a freshman member of the Minority Caucus? And Walter said, it's really my chance to see how the ideas of the framers are actually working out in reality. I want to see whether their hopes, their experiments, their fears played out. Now, one more quick point. It would be interesting to know how Walter would regard that today, whether he thinks the experiment is working. I simply wanted to share that with you because as somebody who did not have your advantage of being in Walter's class, even that one exchange told me this is really an extraordinary man. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Jeff, for coming back over and over again to help share Walter's legacy because I you know you've come back for conferences and you've brought your national voice to Walter's legacy and I, I just want to acknowledge you um, for having done that. Well hi good afternoon everyone my name is Ethan Bertrand I represent Isla Vista and part of UCSB on the Goleta School Board I'm an alum here and my first political experience was working for Congresswoman Caps on her 2014 campaign. Uh, thanks for the panel today. One question I have um, that kind of dawned on me as I was sitting there is we've talked a lot about um, how public confidence in politics and government has declined. And I was also thinking about um, this being in the religious studies department. Um, public confidence and trust in religion has declined too. And when you put, together, when you put the two fields together, uh, when people think about politics and religion and the intersection, a lot of folks are scared. Uh, what lessons from Walter Capps' legacy can help us there, help us find a better future and more, um, I guess, peace in existing? And this might be a conversation we continue at lunch, but that was on my mind. Thank you. I'm going to have you react, but brevity is important. They're hungry. I'll, I'll just say, I think a religion is, a, I mean, connection. It, I, I, ult ultimately, um, Walter was working out really big questions in interpersonal relationships. And I think if you go back to that core, um, healthy government and healthy religion is about healthy connection. It can get diseased really fast. And he was fighting that disease when he portended the rise of the religious right. And we've seen that and we heard from Julie Ingersoll who just wrote, you know, made the, asked the question of you, Katya, but she has, carried forward Walter's legacy in, in her writing on American evangelicalism. Um, but it's, can I, for me, I think it's, it's connection. And I, I, was, I noted the same thing when you said, wow, civic engagement in the religious studies department. I think that's really cool. I, I would just say that this is why we um, teach constructive dialogue in our civic engagement class that is in religious studies. Um, and we bring great folks like you to come speak to our class um, to see the connections in whatever major they are, but it's really cool to get them into the religious studies department, even through an interest of what civic engagement is, and to see the relationship so that they can take it with them in whatever direction they go. Because in my class, they're all different majors. They just tripped and, and fell into the class. And um, I think getting, capturing them and getting them to think about ethics and, and think about how they're going to be engaged in, their, in the future of this country, in their, in their county, in their town, and getting them to really want to buy into that, that they can actually make a difference. Okay. Thanks, Ethan. Hi there, I'm Marnie Michalowski, and I had Walter's class twice. Um, once in, I think, 85, and again in 86, I took an independent study with Tracy and Lisa. And um, so much of what you were all saying, I just identified with so deeply about who he was and what he left in us. And I'm so grateful, um, and I find it a little bit stunning 
we're all still feeling it like it was yesterday. You know, it's so palpable still. And he had such a subtleness to him, but what a power, uh, you know? And we were just talking at the break about, you know, sort of the goofy side of him, where he was so understated and didn't take himself so seriously, and he was one of us. And um, I remember when I took an independent study and I, and I approached him to kind of talk about, like, what's, what am I responsible for? You know, what are the requirements? And he just went... <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, okay. Um, and what I learned was, it was the journey. It was all about the journey. And because I'd had it before, I, I mean, I was already touched deeply and everything. So it just, it, it was so different. There was nobody like him in terms of other professors that I had here. Um, because he really was about, as Lisa was saying, you know, we did so much soul searching. He just, the class stirred so much in us that um, we didn't even anticipate that. We, did, we just showed up, we heard it was a cool class and, you know, some powerful moments and things. But um, just grateful for that journey because it truly was transformative for me, and um, thinking of, of him again, where uh, that he was so approachable, uh, that feeling that I felt seen and heard like I had not before in my journey of learning and everything, and that stuck with me so deeply, and I try, I try to walk that, you know, with my kids, with my community. Um, being quiet, honoring everybody where they are in their journey. And um, yeah, just grateful. I think the power of that class was in the, in the personal narratives that were spoken and um, the vulnerability that was shared opened up so much in me. You know, I was very introverted and kind of was used to a kind of a rote approach to learning and it just, blew up everything. So just grateful and just the generosity and capacity that he had is stunning um, because we all have the same story in, in a different context. So just want to say thank you and grateful that you all made this opportunity available to us and grateful to have walked that time with Walter. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So, food truck outside. Go help yourself to lunch, and we reconvene at 2 p.m. Thank you, everybody. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you, everybody.
Okay, if you could find your seats, please. Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, looking forward to this, this last uh, afternoon of our program. Uh, a lot of exciting things yet to happen. And right now, we have a special presentation uh, entitled Democracy is Born in Conversation, which is probably familiar to almost everyone in this room. And this is a video presentation on Walter Capps' 1996 congressional campaign uh, featuring uh, some very rare footage, very rare indeed. Um, the presenter is Alessandro Duranti, who is Distinguished Research Professor uh, Emeritus, uh, Professor of Anthropology at UCLA, uh, a linguistic anthropologist who studies the tension between convention <coughs> pardon me, conventionality and creativity in everyday encounters, political arenas, and music performances. He has carried out research in Samoa, the US, France, and Italy. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a recipient of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. He has published two articles about Walter Capps' 1995 to 96 congressional campaign. And when I first uh, took my position here, I learned of the work he had done uh, following Walter Capps during his campaign and the commitment he made to studying it. And what an unusual story that was to hear and what a delight it is to know it's uh, coming to fruition for us through this presentation. I personally am just so eager to see what you have to share with us, Professor Duranti. So please, welcome. Okay, hi everybody, and thank you, Greg. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's been an amazing day and a half. I met so many interesting and wonderful and uh, creative people and l uh, learned so much about Walter uh, that I didn't know because I had, as you will see, a very special um, um, well, it's a relationship really, but it's also occasion. It was an occasion of his second campaign uh, for uh, office uh, for the US Congress. So um, that's what I'm gonna talk about. One, one thing I need to say is that um, it's not really a video presentation in the sense that there is video, but it's, it's, it's little clips that I will show you. Uh, I think it's very important for video to uh, be framed and there's never enough framing, but I will do some framing. Um, because video um, can be interpreted in many different ways, and, and I hope to be able to show you something that those of you who know, who knew Walter very, very well, will recognize immediately. For others, there will be uh, other aspects. I think that I will have a chance to show something that's very important uh, in terms of the way Walter was and what he was doing and the way he was thinking. The first thing I need to say before I continue, so this will be like maybe the second thing I need to say. Um, is that this was made possible because of the fact that Walter and Lois, first of all, made it possible. So they allowed me to be around during the campaign, 1995 and 96, when I would drive up from uh, Los Angeles and spend the day with them, uh, often in the car or in the house at, at a rally, um, at a debate. And uh, neither Walter nor Lois ever asked me to turn off the camera. It was something that was accepted. I was accepted as a friend, as a colleague, um, and made it possible to have this documentation that now is also, um, I mean, digital copies and the, the CAPS family has and uh, to decide what to do with it. Okay, the next thing is that I need to mention a metaphor that Walter used for uh, what I was doing. He had lots of metaphors, um, very powerful ones. So the one the, he used, uh, in terms of what I was doing was that the camera was the moral eye. I think that's very important to, to, to remember that, for, especially for what, or some of what I'm gonna show. The other thing is that I am a linguistic anthropologist. What that means, it means that I study human interaction, especially uh, language, discourse, uh, what language um, in all its different ways and form does. Um, so uh, that's what I concentrated on, and from the beginning, 
um, uh, I was interested in this adventure of uh, an academic, an unusual academic. I knew that, that, that Walter was an unusual academic in all the ways that they've been talked about over the last day and a half, but still an academic, a scholar, teacher, who trying to do this other thing that's, that's very different. So I was interested in what would happen, how, what, what kind of transformation, what kind of language would have to be invented or used or adopted or borrowed for somebody like Walter to become a political candidate, to become uh, a, a politician. To tell you the end of the story, short end of the whole thing, just in case I don't get there, which is all can happen when you give a talk, um, he didn't really change that much. I mean, really, the, the, the magic of the thing, I think, for the enterprise was that he, he managed to stay pretty much himself and, and also with his own uh, ways of uh, speaking and being funny or being deep or being, and being creative and being interactive, all of that uh, which you see in or you have seen or heard about in the interactions uh, with students. He brought it into the campaign in very interesting ways. And I, I will show you a couple of examples of that um, uh, shortly. Uh, more generally, uh, I, my point was going to be that I want, what I decided to do is to expand on this metaphor uh, that he used all the time, democracy is born in conversation. Um, and about democracy, I want to say that I think of Walter, um, I can think of Walter in terms of the, the concept that mm, Antonio Gramsci introduced of the democratic philosopher. He thought that all Anybody can be a philosopher, anybody who is able to, to reflect about life and values and um, things can, can be a philosopher, but there were also professional philosophers. But the democratic philosopher is the one who not only can describe and theorize about the world and the human beings, but also can change, wants to change the world. And that's, and that's the kind of philosopher, kind of thinker that I think uh, Walter was and that has been already um, demonstrated uh, here. Uh, so um, I'm taking uh, the, um, the, the, the democracy is born in conversation quite literally, you will see. But first, let me say a couple of things about my project. So um, it turns out that actually I just counted the, the minutes recently. So it turns out that I actually have 43 hours, actually 43 and a half hours of video recording of Walter Capps um, and Lois and many others. Um, in the house, in the car, at rallies and debates. And I use this method as an, an anthropological method, ethnographic method uh, of being there, being around. And, and sometimes people use this metaphor of the fly on the wall. And you will see, sometimes it can't be quite a fly on the wall, but the point was that actually people were incredibly easy and trustful. And, and so the, uh, you'll see them, they're very natural and um, they allow me to, to be with them, and, and so um, the, what the thing that's added, of course, is, is, is the, the, the video camera. And for that, I need to say something else, which is video is very powerful. It's, and is, is video is not necessarily reality, it's not reality, but video has a particular kind of relationship with reality. Um, and depending on the relationship and the history that you have with what is being shown can be very powerful. So I just want to want to tell you that ahead of time, um, and and something that video needs you know care and needs to be thought through and needs to be um, um, introduced. And and so that's why this is not a video presentation because I couldn't sh I could show you 30, 30 minutes <laughs> of all of this, but I don't want to do that. Okay, so. Let me move on. So the main themes um, of my talk are, um, uh, one is about how I got introduced to Walter Capps, um, which was through Lisa Capps. Two is, is about uh, how Walter introduced, uh, sorry, in interacted with supporters and, and also how the beginning of the stump speech. And then there's another part that it hasn't come up very much uh, but I think it's very important with, uh, who Walter was, and, and which is I call second thoughts. Yeah, second thoughts. Um, he thought a lot, he rethought a lot, and he had doubts. And doubting was very important. It was a very important part of who he was. Both professional, I would say, and also personal, the kind of person he was. And part of that was this question, number four. Which one is a better life? Is a better life of what he was, had been doing for 32 years at the University of California, Santa Barbara, which he loved? Uh, or was it better life to try this other thing. 
um, to go into politics. And another important part was uh, theme is stories. Uh, people have mentioned what an incredible storyteller he was, and we'll, I'll talk about that. And then finally, the role of the family, tremendous importance uh, involvement of the family, starting of course with Lois, uh, and, but also of course also with Todd was around a lot, um, and then with Lisa in a different way, and then with Laura also at the White House in a different way. So uh, the way it was, I was introduced um, to Walter was through Lisa Capps, who was a graduate student uh, in clinical psychology at UCLA in the early 1990s, um, and she did a thing that if I can borrow a political metaphor I would call, she crossed the aisle, meaning she left a moment behind clinical psychology, she went into anthropology and applied linguistics, the North Campus, as we call it, UCLA. And she took a course with my wife, Ellen Oaks, um, on narrative, and then another class with Ellen and me on ethnographic methods. Uh, from that came that Eleanor and uh, Lisa started to work together on a book, there was the first book, which uh, eventually was called Constructing Panic. It was about, about a woman affected by agoraphobia. So Lisa used to come over to our house um, to work with Eleanor, and we had some time lunch together. Um, and she would tell me stories about Walter's first campaign. It was the most fascinating story. I, I love those stories. And, and by the way, over time, then you will see the crucial moment was, for, for, for my story was, and well, it was a very important moment, was when David Brostrom was born. Um, and then, and then on that occasion, uh, the UCLA hospital, I met Walter for the first time also, uh, Lois for the first time. And um, so here you see them, uh, Lisa at the computer with Eleanor holding David um, as they were working on uh, constructing panic. So now I don't have a recording of that time, but I have a recording of uh, later during the campaign, the 95 and 96, when um, I did a, an interview with, with, um, with Lisa. Eventually, we went to Venice Beach because um, there was also little David, and uh, we needed to find something for David to do, and he played on the sand while I was interviewing um, uh, Lisa. He, he ate a lot of sand, by the way, that day, but he survived fine. He, and um, so I want to give you a sense a little bit, even if it was a year later, two, maybe two or three years later, but the way in which you, uh, Lisa talked about Walter and, and about the campaign. Okay. What I'm hoping is that his approach, which has always been kind of innovative, like starting the class and kind of going with his gut instinct, yeah. that, that this can turn out to be more of that for him, that instead of feeling like it's you know, being put upon him, that he can kind of look at it as a huge classroom. But part of the problem, I mean, part of the challenge, I think, is to um, free him up. I mean, free up enough space or flexibility. Do you think he's thought about this for a long time, that he wanted to do this? Or just came up suddenly? No, I think he's thought about it for a long, long time. Or at least not about Congress specifically, mm -hmm. but about doing something political and something not academic, purely academic. Yeah. And kind of his whole um, mode has been, in teaching, is just to sort of like take the highfalutin edge out of academic work and mm -hmm. the process. And I think he also has, you know, he, you don't teach classes with 900 students in them unless you want to. So he gets something out of, right. you know, talking to big, huge groups. And But the thing that's neat is that I don't, he, you never could have designed it, he, and he never really tried to design it. And he didn't, when he started working with the veterans, I, he didn't consciously think, okay, here's a huge constituent for me. You know, okay, it wasn't like that, yeah. as much as it kind of naturally evolved. And I think that that um, feeling makes people really want to participate. You know? So... When I met Walter the second time, it was for, uh, after David's baptism um, in Santa Monica. I told him, I said that, uh, I told him that uh, his loss in 1994 election was a good loss. I said that most of what I knew about politics, I learned it from Samoan chiefs. And I knew that there are times when you lose, but you, by losing, you build something for the future. I thought that was his loss was, was that kind. He was puzzled by it. He said, so you think I should run again? Sure, I answered. And then I added, and we could even follow the whole process, documented with video. He liked the idea right away. I could see the scholar in him being attracted by the possibility of reflecting upon 
an otherwise, an, an otherwise quite unusual enterprise for an academic. So here's um, now, uh, first day of recording, I was on November 13, 1995, the night before going uh, through the district, at the time it was the 22nd district, um, first uh, place was going to be a Paso Robles. And, and the people in, the, uh, in his team are at this point here in this room actually watching, watching Bill Clinton on television at that point, particular point, the, sh the shutting down of the government in 1995. Um, uh, here there's uh, Brian Winnick is there uh, and uh, Lindsay Capps. And, and um, Doug will come a few minutes later. And, and Walter is looking at something that they that Lindsay and, and Doug have been working on, and, and he is focusing on this, um, this point that they made, that they think they're interpreting what he had said at some other point, which is to promise to restore faith in, poli in politics. And he doesn't like it. So he goes back and forth about this, and they, over, t over dinner time, they go back to this, with this phrase, and he really doesn't like it. He says, I can't promise, and explain why that's not a thing that he should do or he could do. And he eventually ends up focusing on campaign finance reform, which would be part of his stump speech the next day. Um, so the next day, that's the first day of the campaign, November 14, 1995, and we're in the car, and there is uh, Walter uh, driving, and Lois and Doug and me, and also we'll see that Brian and, and two, two Palmer will also be coming, and Lindsay. And, and the first stop actually is in some big mission where um, they find the mission is actually closed, but they stop to pray there as, a, as, as the beginning of the day. Um, and then they go to, um, to Palo, Paso Robles. How are you? Thanks for coming out. Thank you very much for coming out. Give us a good start for the beginning of the day and the beginning of the season. So thanks an awful lot for coming out here today. Uh, the uh, we 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 actually started up at the San Miguel Mission this morning, and we slept across the street, got up early, went up there. And come, we're going to spend the whole day now. And this is the first official announcement. But uh, well, there, there, there are going to be two announcements. The first announcement is that we're, we are running uh, for Congress from the 22nd District. And it's definite. Uh, we've got people all over the place who are getting signatures. And, and so, this, so, so today is the day. This is the day of the official announcement. But the second announcement is just as important. And that is, we, we will win this time. We will win this time. <laughs> you know, how, how, do, how do I know that? How do I know we're going to win? <laughs> well, you know, I can see it in your faces. I mean, <laughs> Okay, and, and there, is, there is actually, I watched this maybe, I'm not exaggerating, 35 times, um, and there's a lot of magic there that happens. There is this idea that he comes up with uh, having two announcements. Um, they're not really two announcements. The first one is an announcement that he's running, but the second one about winning is not really literally an announcement, but he makes it into an announcement. And the point is to get feedback, to get the, 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 the audience, this small crowd he has there involved. And, but in the first one, and I did a little analysis to show you what I do, it's just a, only this is the only time I'm gonna show you. If, if we think about this as a call and response, this will look, look at what Walter is doing. He's actually repeating the same thing in a different phrasing each time. We're running for Congress uh, for on this 22nd district. Nothing happens, and it's definite. Nothing happened. Let's try it again. We've got people all over the place who are getting signature. Nothing. No, no response. And so, so today is the day. This is the day the official announcement. Nothing. You know, they don't respond. Okay, but the second thing happens. The second announcement, this time, when he goes. The second announcement is just as important. And it is that we will win it this time. We will win. And there's a little lady there who starts getting very excited. She starts clapping and smiles like that. And, and that breaks the ice. And the rest, and the rest of the little crowd goes, goes with them. And everybody's clapping. And now he got them, right? And now, so once, once he got them, then he can invent a third thing that happens, to, which is it is, and how do I know? How do I, I know I know that? How do I know we're going to win? And then, People laughing. They think it's still funny. Like the other thing was funny. And then once he gets it in, he gets everybody involved. He says, well, you know, I can see it in your faces. And again, there's a laughter. And then from this, we're not going to see it. But he builds the whole the history of his relationship 
to the, to, to the, the people, relationship to the district. And it's, this is what I call the Oregon Trail story, or coming, or coming, coming through from Yale with Lois uh, 32 years before. And, it, and it's an emotional story, an emotional story which, which, which ends, it's full of after ends. And this, because I, why? I know, I know this district. I know because you are the people with whom we have lived our lives. Our lives, and that—that that is the thing, and, the, and he, he, he know, and he has them, and, he, and they're with him, and they love him, and it's a, it's a great moment of the first, very first stump speech that he gives. Now here's just a little later, San Luis Obispo. It looks the same, but well, let's have a look at that. We just want to show you that. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce a congressman we can be proud of. Walter Caps. I came here. I came here actually to make two announcements. The first announcement is that we are we are running. Uh, I'm I'm a candidate for Congress for the United States Congress in the 20th district. It's definite. We're filing. Everything is in order. Okay. And then the uh, and and the second announcement I think is probably even more important. The second announcement is that we will win. We will win. Yeah. Yeah. How, do we, uh, how, how do we know we're, how do we know we're going to win? Uh, I, I can tell you. The reason we're going to win is that, um, that I have every confidence that I represent majority opinion, the majority of viewpoint of the people in the 22nd. Yeah. Okay, so very briefly, but notice here, this time it works, I should describe it. It has to do it five times. And finally, the fifth time, they get it. And, and they clap it with him, you know, about, about uh, that I'm definitely going to run. The first announcement. The second announcement is very, very interesting. So, so they do the same thing. So the crowd is, is with him. But look what happens. When he's trying to do the same trick, it's the other one. Of the, well, how do I know that we're going to win? This time it doesn't work. He goes, how do we know? How do we know we will? How do we know we're going to win? Intonation is different. And there is a thing that happens that is far away. This, there are all these factors. Everybody who's, who's, who's done this knows this difference. There's, there's, a, there's a distance. He feels this distance, and he can't quite do the same kind of humor they have, the same kind of feeling he had before. And another thing that happens, I don't know if you noticed, is that he's pulling, he pulled out his speech. And now he has the written speech in front of him, which he couldn't do, Pastor Robert, because it was too small of a place. There was no podium. And all of these things matter. All these things matter in terms of being able to connect to the audience, being able to say certain things, being able to feel good about it, which was very important. Okay, this is about thinking, second thoughts. Okay, here we go first. Going to sign. This is uh, December 28th, after a long staff, a meeting with, uh, with, with a kind of a uh, problem-solving team. You talk with him. He's having second thoughts. Oh, no, well, no, no, no. Second thoughts. You should. I think the real question is who's going to sign, Walter or Lois? <laughs> She's way out ahead. Yeah, I think yeah. I might go for it. Maybe that's going to be. Oh, all of the campaigns. All, all, the, all, the, all the good advice is still there. Totally available. You'd be great, too. And Todd will help us. You would be great. All right. So this, um, I'm actually going to skip this, but is that uh, he goes to sign and, and he just start playing this funny game where should I sign, should I sign, Brian, should I sign, two, should I sign? And, and at some point I go, Walter, I go, you better sign because they're running out of battery. And everybody laughs and Walter signs. So in that case, the fly on the wall didn't really work as a metaphor. Okay, just in case. All right. So, um, and this now is, is, is about this question of not just the, the doubts, but also the question about which life is the best life. And I want to show you this from the first the debate in San Luis Obispo. Well, I got into politics as a kind of extension of the teaching that I had been doing. 
Uh, the, the courses that I teach, I've been accused of being ivory tower, um, which I think is insulting to uh, the entire teaching profession, but uh, I don't think I'm very ivory tower. Although in some ways I wish I were, because there's a, that's a great tradition as well, to be able to take a look at, at what's going on in society and make sense of it. So, ivory tower, is it a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing. There's some good things about ivory tower. Um, so now I want to show you another one, and it, this this is uh, it's it's I ask we're it's dark at night. I still turn on the camera. Watching knew that I was recording all the time, um, and I ask him how is this uh, time different from the first time, and then he he says this is you know we're doing you know we're better and so forth. It goes on like that, and then at some point then he starts talking about um, what what he thinks about the process of running for office. And it's, and it's at the end of a very, very long uh, day. Also, there was a debate. And, and so that should be taken in that context. But there is, there is something important that he says. And here, I want to say that what we see here is something in the second book that Lisa wrote with Eleanor. Uh, it's called Living Narrative. And they talk about the fact that telling stories, there's always this tension. that can be this tension between the cohesion, coherence, you know, the storyline. Um, and then at the same time, authenticity, um, some, to, to, to other side, to bring out other side that might be left behind uh, or not mentioned, and, and that can take you on tangents and have all kinds of reflections that are different from, from the main story, the way the story is organized. And here we go now, it's going to be subtitled. When you live at the University of California the way we have all these years, I'm always looking for accomplishment, for achievement, you know, for either having a class where people learn or, or writing something that's going to be published. Th this thing seems so, uh, uh, there's no, uh, in Greek terms, uh, telos. Um, I, I'm not making any money doing it. In fact, I'm losing money. Uh, you know, going up there tonight is, the, the goal, I guess, is to get elected, but that's not my highest ambition in life, so I, I don't I don't have a I don't have a clear sense of purpose in it. It's more like an adventure, um, sort of like being open to possibilities, and that's kind of ephemeral at this age. So I don't know. I, but then there have been some other times that have been so glorious that you can't believe it. It would never happen either if we hadn't been doing this. But I've never, I've never quite had the, the uh, thrill of um, what happens sometimes in teaching, where somebody really gets gets an insight, mm -hmm. and maybe for the first time, and you can just see it all over their faces. I don't think that happens in this field. I don't. And I think what you're trying to do is stay out of the mud and try not to be, I said, contaminated tonight, but. And more, um, what is the word, compromised. It's kind of like walking in a field of temptation. You know, walking in the world of sin and trying to not sinning, sort of. I don't trust it. I know I don't trust it. But the other, I don't think you know how you feel about it when you're going through it. I think it's like that. I don't know. I don't think you think you know about it until you go, when you're going through it. Um, I asked later, much later, to to Doug uh, I, while I was reviewing my notes whether uh, about whether it was true that my impression that Walter did not like staff meetings, and he answered me. This is later in '99. He said, "No meeting with staff, boy. You got that one right." And so this is, we got a system of bringing staff issues to all through me, then created a system for scheduling. Another time when staff usually meets with a candidate using Lois as the go-between and sometimes the decision maker. This allowed him to consult with his own sources too, which he really seemed to enjoy. That way he came to his own conclusions without being fed an approach. You see again, there's authenticity here. And as you know, he sometimes wrote his own positions or letters to the editor. I remember one uh, to the New York Times uh, when we got calls 
the, to determine if he actually came, the letter came from the candidate. The one in question was a response to an editorial that Walter Capps would not be as effective as Andrea Streestrand. The response ended with a quote from Madonna's song, You'll See. Walter Capps would have never written this letter or quoted Madonna, said the reader. Fact is, Walter sent a letter from his fax at home to the newspaper editor. First time we saw it was when he showed up in print. Okay. But now here's the thing. Here's the strength. Okay. Finding the story. So this is a, uh, going to this place here. The last time he taught the class Vietnam War. Okay. So what's going to happen today in your class? Today, today is the final uh, day of the... Um, class on the Vietnam War. There'll be some veterans there who want to talk a little bit. There'll be uh, a couple of students who are going to pay tribute to their uh, dads who were uh, who fought in the war, and I'm going to do a little bit of a summary uh, of the class, but by now you don't have to do very much summary because they've all got the point. And there'll be a little music at the end. Always, always have to have music. So that's it. That car went by pretty fast. Okay, so here's the first story. The first story um, is, uh, uh, well, let's, let's see. Let's hear we had a speaker here one year, Jim Garrett from uh, South Dakota, who was, uh, um, he said Sioux Indian, but he read it before Lakota. And he was in Vietnam, and he said they had just been in a firefight, and I think I told some of you the story already. They had just been in a firefight, and they walked through a village, and he was, he was, Grateful to be alive that they had taken a number of hits, some casualties, some wounded, and some boys, some children came his way. He was worried that, that the children were death dealers and somebody might be carrying a grenade or a rifle or somebody could blow away one of the children. And he watched this one boy in particular, and the boy uh, proceeded to, to approach uh, Jim Garrett. And when he got right up to Jim Garrett, he used the two fingers of his hand pointed to his eyes and Jim's eyes back and forth and said, same, 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 same. And had noticed that Jim's eyes being Lakota eyes were similar to his eyes being Vietnamese eyes. What Jim told us when he, after telling us that story, is that he realized, he said, these are his words, that what links us as human beings is more compelling than what defines us. What links us as human beings is more compelling and what divides us. The same, 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 same is symbolic of that truth. Okay, so where, where do you get the stories and, and, and how do you make stories that are relevant to the conversation? And, and Walter was always looking for, for good stories to tell. And, and now I'm gonna show you another story, this much later. Um, now it's October 7, um, League of Women's Voter, and in a political debate. Second story. I, uh, I want to very much thank the League for sponsoring this, and I want to thank all of you for being here. I think this is the way uh, democracy grows. Democracy is born in conversation. If we could have more of these, we, would have to, we, we wouldn't have to do quite as much of it over television. Uh, I, I grew up in the state of Nebraska, and I was a boy during the Second World War. And my uncle Carl came home after being wounded in Germany, and we had long talks about war and about life. And he said to me one time that what was so curious to him, when he was fighting the Germans, that they both look alike and they prayed to the same God. Now, I went to the old mission yesterday morning, and Andrea Seastrand was there, and I was glad for that. We prayed to the same God, I know. We prayed the Lord's Prayer, sang some of the same hymns and uh, listen to the same sermon. When I got home from church, I watched television, and television, an ad on television said, and I'm quoting, when Polly Class's killer got the death penalty, two people were disappointed, Richard Allen Davis, the murderer, and Walter Capps. Okay, okay. Now, now I want Andrew Seastrand to know that I was not disappointed, but there's a bigger truth here. Andrew Seastrand knows this isn't true. She knows this isn't true, but this is what happens in politics. This is what happens. This demeans the human spirit. I am there to offer an alternative. My name is Walter Capps. I'm running for U.S. Congress. Yeah. So.
So um, in my field, sometimes we talk about it as intertextuality, which means you borrow from one text to go into another, from one occasion to another. So this is the poetics of talk, we could say. In the Vietnam War, Jim Garrett, Dakota Indian, has the same eyes as the Vietnamese boy, and still they are on opposite sides. And in the second story, Uncle Carl, in World War II story, I call it, he was fighting the Germans who look alike and pray to the same God. Third story, Walter Capps, Democrat, and Andrea Sister, I was sitting two people down on, on the same table. Republican, pray to the same God, sang the same hymns, listened to the same sermon. And yet, they were defined as enemies in terms of the way that Walter described that ad against him. Okay, final part is the family, the huge role of the Caps family, tremendous, tremendous role of everybody, and incredible family, as everybody has talked about before, amazing support. And there was, um, family was everywhere, and Walter was with the family, and, and the family was what families are, full of love and concerns and conversations, and also amazing campaigners, and ready to help. And the life at home was mixed with the life of the campaign. And so anything can happen. Well, uh, somebody could be putting a uh, request for donation into, into, into envelopes, as happens in this context, as you will see. And then Walter will be playing the piano, and here you are. <laughs> to go for a little rally. So, yes. today's Tuesday election day. So what's, uh, what, are you, what are you thinking about? I'm thinking that we're gonna win. Why? Why? I just think we are. I really do. What are the signs? The signs are everywhere we walk, people honk and wave. I've been shaking hands in front of Walmart. People that, I think the same people who were saying cap sucks two years ago are now enthusiastic. What was it like when you went and uh, talked to people house by house? It was hilarious. Well, we went to a tough district. So, it was okay. I mean, most of the time you knock on the door and they say like, oh, hi, we know you, we're so happy. Yeah, we're supporting your dad. Other times people would just like open the door and say, I don't want any. And I'd say, he's my dad, and then they would cover their mouths. I'm doing a little interview. That's great. Yeah. He's my dad. Okay, so we got all the way to November 5th, 1996. Here's the family, uh, part of the family at least, but uh, waiting for results all together in front of an anchor woman. And here we go. So I talked about the fact that really politics in a sense is ubiquitous. Um, in the car, in, in the TV room, talking to uh, supporters, um, different contests here is the UCSB. Uh, talk, he's gonna talk to the students. Um, and, uh, and, the, and he is introducing Bill Bradley uh, in the bookstore uh, in, in Santa Barbara. And he's at home talking about Jefferson. He had been reading Jefferson that morning, and he's being interviewed here after that terrible accident he had in Lois Head. Um, and here's right next to C. Strand, the incumbent, and uh, having a debate. 
uh, and here's students in a school. And here's meeting Hillary Clinton. It was a great day with a huge crowd. And here's with Laura in the car who come from the White House to be with Walter and Lois that day. And here's the president arriving. And here's Lisa with little David. Here is the president, Bill Clinton. Total vote number, Walter Katz, 51,053, Andrea Cesar, 39,000. Okay, um, the first th last thing I'm going to say is there's a coda. There's a coda. Here's my coda. Um, so many years later today, uh, in addition to this amazing story of success of Walter being able to win in a district that had, had a Republican um, representative for 50 years, uh, despite his own you know, ways of doing the campaigning, uh, and maintaining and fighting to maintain the sense of authenticity, uh, but with this amazing support from his family. So, but now, many, many years later, we know another, another success story, which I think is built on perhaps in different, different, on a different style, different kind of skills, but equally remarkable. Uh, that's the story of Lois' political success her long tenure as a U.S. representative. And I did not document Lois' campaign, and therefore I can't assess her performance or do the analysis that I've done over the years of Walter's speeches. Uh, but I can say that my documentation shows again and again that Lois was the best kept secret during Walter's campaign. She was recognized by Walter himself and those who worked with, for him and with him as an ideal candidate who could have run as well. This proves that there are different possible success stories, different characters, different strengths, different appeal, but there's also something that was not different. There was a sheer sense of duty, a call to work for the common good, a trust in the sacredness of the human spirit, and the need to protect it and let it shine. In this respect, the legacy of Walter as ability to merge the political engagement with a spiritual commitment to the human spirit is also the legacy of Lois' engagement and commitment. And as a last thing I'm gonna show you, and this is really true, I'm gonna show you after Walter won, the next morning they go to a Spanish station, Spanish speaking station, and suddenly we see uh, Lois, it's an early, an early version of what the Lois said that many of you met. Uh, learn later. Here it is. La señora Lois Caps. Adelante, por favor. Thank you, Kevin. It's an honor for me to be speaking for a minute or two to give tribute to all of you who are voting today, who have already voted perhaps or will vote, because I know that you are doing this for your families. And I want to mention that I have learned so much. I've wor been working for many years among you in Santa Barbara as a school nurse for many of the schools, Harding School, McKinley School, Adams School, Cleveland School, Franklin School, all of the schools in Santa Barbara and the Pace Center at Santa Barbara High School. And from you, from, from all of you, I learned uh, your value for the family. I hold it very sacred in my heart, the way that children are honored and respected and the way that the elderly are treated and, and revered and cared for. This is something I think we need to bring back to our whole society. It's a gift you can give all of us and I'm honored that this is something that Walter and I believe in so fully. And today our grandson is here with us in the studio and our family, his parents are with us and it's the, tr the treasure of our day to have our family surrounding us today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Durante. That was, that was amazing and sets us up so nice for our last session. What I would like is this. We're a little bit off schedule, but that's not a problem. Uh, a, a
10 minute break to get some coffee, use the bathroom, a treat, whatnot, but please be back in your seats at three o'clock and we'll uh, round out this wonderful event now that we have such great context in front of us, both in image and speech. Thank you, Professor Durante. Okay.
Hello? Correct. And then at the very end, and I'll, I'll defer to you on this, when you feel like it's wrapped up, call Lou up to give the final closing words. He's going to need some help. Actually, it'll start in because it'll take a little bit to get up there. So I'll just kind of leave that to you. And yeah, I think we're fine on time. Audience questions, too. And do you want that to happen before it comes? Yeah. To do that, so you, the timing's all you. And I think we're fine because on the back end, we just have the reception. Exactly. And there's. But I won't wait. Yeah, no, but we're fine. I'm going to yeah, so take a few minutes. Speaks, we'll come. Yeah, exactly. Let's do that. And um, I'm going to say a few words about the CAP Center Perfect. right now, if Perfect. that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, cool. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get going. All right, thank you. Um, before we move to our last panel, I just want to share a few words. First of all, a confession. Um, I'm standing out here, out from behind the podium, because you may have detected I'm not comfortable behind a podium. That's not the space I usually uh, work in, even though I'm an academic. I work in communities. I work with people. Uh, when I teach, I don't stand behind a podium. Uh, it makes me deeply uncomfortable. So uh, here I am, more in your face, and that's where I'd like to be. So because I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Walter H. Cap Center and what we're doing today. I don't want to distract from the main uh, point of the celebration, which is Walter Capps himself and his legacy in all the domains we've talked about. Uh, but the center participates in that legacy and is moving it forward. So I just want to share a little bit with you about what we've been doing and what you can expect from us going forward. Uh, second confession. I've never felt all that great about being, having been born in Omaha, Nebraska. Because my parents moved the family to Colorado when I was two weeks old. And I've been proud of that ever since. People ask me, where are you from? Colorado. My two kids are in the back, two of them. They'll call me out. They say, Dad, are you sure? Look at your driver's license. It says Omaha, Nebraska. I'm like, oh, man, no, no, you don't have to say that. But then I begin to think, wait a minute. Walter Capps, Bob Carey, Malcolm X. <laughs> Maybe not such a bad place after all. And so one thing I've taken away from these last two days is, damn it, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and I'm proud of that. So thank you very much. <clears throat> this conference has been really great for me for selfish reasons. As the person charged with carrying forward the mandate of the CAP Center, I've worked with the handicap of only knowing him on paper. Uh, and I've looked through a lot of papers and some video but really didn't have a flesh and blood sense of who he is. And I still don't have that, of course, but I have the next best thing, which is your memories of him. Uh, the last two days, I've just learned so much about community, about responsibility, reciprocity, just who he was as a person. So, so long as I continue to direct the center, that will inform what I do. And so this has been an invaluable gift. I want to thank everyone who's participated. Uh, I now know Walter Capps and his vision so much better than I did before. Um, a few things that we do at the center that I'm really proud of, and we're perpetuating what, what Clark Roof had done for so many years so well, and others with him, Noni Hamilton, Greg Jarrett, and others who've worked at the center longer than I have. We continue in that great work. We teach classes on ethics. Katya Armistead talked about the civic engagement class. Noni Hamilton does a fabulous job with our uh, undergraduate McCune internship program. We have a graduate fellowship program, the Mendel Fellowship. Uh, so all this continues apace. It's fantastic work. Look for our students in the community. We're so proud of what they do. 
programming, we continue the tradition of what I'd like to think is fantastic programming. Uh, sometimes one-off events, sometimes more iterative events. We did a whole year on Native American sacred spaces, for example, so building themes. But what I'm most excited about is the next step beyond that. How do we take that back to the community? One-off events aren't enough. Uh, how do we persuade people that we're actually doing something in their communities? We're only taking baby steps at this point, but they're gonna become bigger steps. One project we have is on the east side of the Sierra Nevada. It's funded by the National Science Foundation. I'm actually working with one of uh, Alessandro Durante's uh, prize PhD students, Justin Richland, on this. We're working with uh, some of the Paiute tribes in their conversations with the federal government about wildland fire management. You might be thinking, what does that have to do with the CAP Center? I don't know the first thing about fire other than it burns and burns things up. But what I do know is it ignores jurisdictions. And so when fires come bear down on Bishop, Mammoth, these places, they're also at that same time bearing down on native peoples. So how do those peoples get out front of these issues, work with the federal government in a way that's something more robust than mere consultation? That's the insulting standard the federal government usually hews to. So this is a project about say, what's the next step in making this process more human, more engaged, more full-throated for native peoples? We don't fashion that we can uh, change this overnight or maybe at all, but we can help convene conversations about it. And that, to my mind, is exactly, as I learned the last few days, what Walter would have done. Sit people down and say, what are we talking about? How can we have this conversation? Why are we here? A similar project in Hawaii is about implementing the United Nations Declaration on uh, the Rights of Indigenous Peoples there, just working with local communities. What are their interests? How do they use this international mechanism to speak back to state and federal entities about their interests? Again, it's about conversations, about community-level learning. You can expect more along these lines. Associate Director uh, Dusty Hosley, who's so instrumental to putting on this very conference, I want to say, uh, he's put together a grant with the Luce Foundation, and this is about Asian American religious freedom. This is also an iterative project that's been ongoing for the last year and will continue. Um, so again, the point is, yes, we do programming, please come, we'll be doing more in the community, but also look to our follow-on projects. That's what we're really invested in right now. How do we make good on Walter's promise that these conversations can continue to happen in communities? Um, I invite you to reach out to me with ideas about programming and projects. So I'm easily reached through the CAP Center, but I'm also just gjohnson at ucsb.edu, easy to find. Uh, we're very receptive to ideas you may have. What matters here in this community? How might we address it? Uh, we wanna know, and I'm a newcomer. I can't presume to know what the issues are, but I'd love to hear from you. Okay, I, I could say more, but I'll stop there. I just wanted you uh, to have a sense where we're headed. Oh, well, one thing I, I should mention. Our next event is in January. Kiara Bridges will be visiting us. She's a professor at, UC, at Berkeley Law, and she's an expert on the intersection of critical race theory and reproductive justice. Uh, the Legal Humanities Initiative and the, the Health Humanities Initiative are working together with us to sponsor this important talk. Uh, please come out. If you've ever seen her speak, you'll know. Uh, it, it won't be forgettable. And so we, we invite you. This is January 19th. It'll be posted on our website and so forth. Okay, now back to the program you were promised. Um, I would like to call to the stage uh, someone who's become a friend, but who is nonetheless my boss, and who is a convener of conversations himself. And I would give you a longer introduction, the one he deserves, except that you all know him, Chancellor Henry Yang. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, it is such an honor and a pleasure to be here today to celebrate and uh, commemorate the life and the legacy of Walter Capps and uh, the many ways in which he contributed to the higher education and the public service. I would first like to thank our colleagues of Cap Center for putting together this wonderful, wonderful two-day program. So well done, so meaningful. Thank you. And, and especially uh, thanks to uh, our director, Greg Johnson. Greg, thank you. Thank you for your leadership. And also, of course, I, 
I, uh, I, I, I also like to uh, give a very special uh, warm welcome to the Caps family, the wonderful Caps family. Uh, okay. Uh, when I, now I'm uh, bringing my memory back uh, to uh, 1994. I remember Dylan and I first time visited campus. Before we, we visited campus, and uh, the UCOP president, Jack Peltersen, told me, he said, well, Henry, you, 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 ought to, you ought to take a look at the campus before you, you go there. So we came on, uh, on a day in uh, April of 1994. So we can. And he said that, remember, UC Santa Barbara is very well known in the country, just like University Princeton, uh, Princeton University, for three things, one in the east, one in the west. I said, what are the three things? He said, first, each one has a wonderful, wonderful top religious studies program. Another is they also are very good in theoretical physics. And another third thing is they don't have a medical school. So, so this, that's why the, uh, the secret formula of excellence, that's what he said. So we came here, we met the Walter. Uh, of course, I was very anxious to meet uh, our religious uh, studies famous professors. At, at that time, you remember the young faculty, Richard Hacht, and the Ninian Smart, Robert Michelson. I can go on for a dozen of lists. Uh, Lois, you probably can remember those names, those people. And uh, uh, when I talked to Walter and uh, and we had a deep conversation. Uh, he had one thing in mind, I had one thing in mind. What I had in mind is asking for his advice, how can we stop that project They're called a Clearview project? They want to build a 175 foot tower on campus, you know, slant drill the oil. You, know, you can see our campus just could not accept that. And then he was talking to me about, uh, he was pondering about running for the Congress. So we had uh, some conversation. Then after that, uh, we went back to where we came from, Indiana, and, uh, and we, uh, uh, we started to understand about his course, his classes on the Vietnam War, religious and the impact of Vietnam, and the voices of the stranger were some of the most popular in the history of our campus. On, I remember on a Sunday, I just couldn't believe, you know, in the, in the cornfield in Indiana, you turn on the television, A and E channel, here's Walter Capps was giving his Vietnam course. That's nationally televised. I mean, very seldom our courses can be nationally te televised. Dylan and I, that Sunday, I remember we had a Sunday brunch and just watch him for that. Uh, then uh, 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 also, of course, later on, the following month, it was on the 60 Minutes about his Vietnam course. So when I came here, I had a lot of conversation about this course. He said, oh, Henry, why don't you come to my class to give a lecture one time? It was in this very hall, filled, filled with 700 people, I remember. So during that time after, uh, after, after, after uh, the class, I asked a student who was a veteran, I said, do you think, uh, what are the chances of a voter uh, running for the Congress? He told me, he said, well, he could heal the wounds of Vietnam veteran. He sure can heal the wound of the country. I think he'll have no problem getting elected. So from there, I, 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 uh, uh, I, I told Walter, I said, it's going to be a smooth sail. Uh, so of course he was elected. When he first elected, he told me, he said, he said Henry, uh, I'm going to be served on the science committee. So when he served on the science committee, uh, I couldn't believe it. Our, our research grant just coming in. The UCSB had a very beautiful, <laughs> beautiful two years after that. And uh, the, those physicists, engineers, just think the world of him <laughs> during the time. <laughs> and and uh, well, I, ca I can just, just keep telling you my experience with, uh, with Walter. And, and Walter was... Um, you know, here on campus, uh, he has shared his inspiring vision and creating the center uh, where our students, faculty, and the public uh, could, could all discuss issues to define our humanity, including religion, war and peace, ethics, public life. And now, since uh, what, uh, our campus, since what uh, uh, happened on October 6th, October 7th, the, the, 
the thing most needed on our campus is public discourse. I think uh, CAP Center is a perfect place to do public discourse. And so we'll, 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 we'll got the work cut out for us. And our EVC is here, you are here, and we are all committed. And, uh, and uh, I, I guess, I guess uh, the rest uh, you all know, I probably don't need to say much, but we just, I just miss Walter so much. Uh, in my life, every time when I close my eyes, I can remember that evening, uh, Lois, you and me and a lot of volunteers and family members at point Port, Port Wainimi waiting for his jumbo uh, uh, aircraft carrier from the Air Force landed and, uh, and uh, he was honored and wrapped by the uh, star, uh, you, you know, American flag. And we were, we were waiting for him till two in the morning, I still remember that. I miss him tremendously, but our campus is enormous, enormous, proud, and, and honored to have Walter to be our faculty member. And ever since the second year when it was founded 30 years ago, and the next year we'll celebrate 60 years, uh, the, 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 the diamond celebration of the religious studies department. Uh, now, without further ado, let me have the honor to introduce uh, our panel today, uh, the Honorable Bob Carey. I always remember the day you walked into my office with Walter in 1994, and uh, and and just, it's just uh, I think we all know you, so so you need no no <laughs> no introduction, and also the Honorable Lois Caps, and uh, the Supervisor Laura Caps and uh, uh, our alum, alumni community advocate, Todd Capps, and the uh, and, uh, journalist, author, and a biographer, Lois, uh, Lou Cannon. Lou, so nice to, to welcome here. I always remember the first day I came to campus, you give me the, the advice. You say, remember, always return the call return the phone call. Whoever called you, always return the call. Now I remember I advise everyone, re return the email. <laughs> Thank you. We just heard our older sister talk for the first time in 20 years. This has been a pretty heavy couple of days. Yeah. So uh, my therapist wife would say, we need to check in, right? This is how I check in. I'm going to go first, and I need your help. Deo! Deo! One more time. Deo! Deo! I think we're ready. All right, Todd, awesome. Thanks to my big brother for that. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for so many of you who've been through the whole program here and some who've just joined us and our family in Portland and the Bay Area that are watching and elsewhere. Uh, I, can, I think my, my brother and my mom would agree that this is overwhelming for us in a, in a good way, in a really good way, and I look forward to kind of unpacking in the days and weeks and months and years to come. So thanks to the CAP Center. Thanks to all of you who came, to so many of our speakers to our chancellor who literally was there the night that my mom and I uh, were with the casket as it came, we came across the country completely shell-shocked and landed, as he said, in Point Wainimi. And uh, it's two in the morning and there's Chancellor Yang waiting for us uh, as we entered a new chapter of our lives. And so um, we're, we're gonna have a free-flowing conversation here, but I did uh, have some questions that I'll help kick us off. And I'm definitely no scholar, but I am, was a history major, and so I just want to set a couple dates out for context here. Um, because we're sitting with the person who, if our, if our dad had a, had a light um, about this transition from academics to uh, public life, to politics, the, the gentleman here, the Navy SEAL, 
the Medal of Honor winner, the United States Senator, the governor, he definitely lit that spark uh, faster than it would have been lit otherwise. And so when uh, the CAP Center came to us with this I wonderful idea to do this, uh, this symposium, the first thought is, oh, I wonder if, if Bob Carey would come. And sure enough, he said yes, and he's here. And it's great for us to have him. It's a true, true honor. So our task with this panel is to talk a bit about um, that transition that you saw so beautifully documented through video that we haven't seen before to much degree um, from Professor Durante of the, the, the academic to the politician. And what did that mean for him? Uh, what it was his role in public life? What is the role of public life now in such a confusing time? So, and, I, and we're just going to talk a little bit here, and then I do want to turn it over to some questions or comments, because what's been so powerful for me um, over the last day and a half is just what's come out of uh, those who've chosen to come here. So thank you so much. So some dates are that my parents, our parents met in 1957. They married in 1960. Todd, uh, our first Lisa was born in 1964, then Todd in 66. Me in 72. Um, I just give these dates because they frame somewhat this conversation. Senator Kerry was, Senate, uh, was governor first from 1983 to 1987. Somehow during that time, I think it was 1986 perhaps, um, our dad wormed his way into the uh, Capitol uh, in, in Nebraska and met the then governor and invited him to his class. And then he came. I remember it was a big day with all the accoutrements of a governor uh, coming to a small town like this. And from that led a, a wonderful friendship that, uh, as I want to ask him about, led to him co-teaching the class in between his service as governor and senator from Nebraska. But I'm going to start with you, Mom, as I should appropriately, the person who's known our dad the longest, um, because clearly this theme of public service was something that um, Walter Capps was destined into, in different, and it took different forms, and it evolved. And this is in conversation with you. How, how did you see that, if you could kick us off, um, how did you see that approach evolve over time? What, like his notion of public service, uh, where'd that come from? He was first generation college. Um, what didn't necessarily come from his parents, but where did the, how did that evolve from academics to politics, and how did you, how was your, from your catbird seed, how did you see that evolution? Is this on? There we go. There you go. Thank you, Laura. And um, it's so fitting that we're in this space to do this today. Many of you have made note of that already. Um, but you asked me a question, and I, and I have to go back to a tiny bit of biography of Walter in Omaha. Uh, growing up in a Swedish Lutheran part of the community, it was sort of preordained that he was going to go on somehow and become a Lutheran preacher. But he had a kind of a jumbled um, undergraduate career out in the Northwest, well, between the Midwest and the Northwest. And it included, by chance almost, a introduction to philosophy at an ordinary community college in Portland, Portland State. Even before it was Portland State University, it was Portland State College. And it unlocked something in him. Because he went on to the seminary, we met around that time, so I don't know all of the details, but he got an opportunity in his last year at the seminary to get a scholarship to Yale University Divinity School for a master's. Because he realized, I think, during that time, and maybe some other people realized as well, that he could think, and uh, maybe did, could do well in academics. So we spent four years, that was the beginning of our marriage, in New Haven, Connecticut. And then, as some of you might be graduate students, there comes a time in those days, 1964, 
when postings for job openings in the fall would be on the bulletin board in the graduate hall. And Walt came home one day so excited. He said, there is an opening for a professor of religious studies at the University of California in Santa Barbara. I want to go. I want to apply. Now, his classmates thought he was a little crazy. Santa Barbara? Where's that? That's, isn't that out there somewhere in California where people go to retire? <laughs> or maybe they grow lemons or something like that? Anyway, the, the, the topic was brought up yesterday by David Marshall, thankfully, that it was, this is, or this campus has the distinction of the first campus of the United, in, or a non, let's see, let, let me put it, phrase it right, taxpayer supported institution that would offer a course in religious studies. And Walter was the second person hired. It came, the idea for the, having the department, a department came out of the sociology or political science department, one of those, David said. And so we came with our, from graduate school. I was seven months pregnant with Lisa with a U-Haul trailer behind our old pink Buick down over Siskiyou Pass into this little town, first Goleta, and then downtown Santa Barbara, and here we were. And he opened up shop in one of the barracks in his office, and the department and joined the faculty. His dream had come true of being able to teach about, about religion teach religious studies in a secular setting. And the rest is pretty much history. Can I, can I add a little yeah, thing? I love the story. Uh, as I hear it, they arrived, uh, first shopping trip was to Santa Cruz Market, which is not far from here in <laughs> Old Town Goleta. Uh, and coming from an, <laughs> a Norwegian heritage, mom sees this entire rack of flour tortillas and says, my gosh, there must be a huge Norwegian community here. Look at all this lefse. <laughs> if you've been to Solvang, you yeah. know what that is. I had never seen a flour tortilla. I've seen a few since. So we have... Uh... I'm, I'm reminded we have a lot of good public servants in the audience. We have our former state senator, Hannah Beth Jackson. We yeah. have uh, political esteemed journalists, Luke Cannon and Jeff Greenfield, who know a heck of a lot about um, people running for office. But this notion of a professor running for office is pretty unusual. Um, I, I realize, uh, Senator, that you did it the opposite way. You were in politics and public life and then went to academia. And I just wonder if you... If you saw, when you met our dad, um, any notions or any memories you have of this, of a potential budding politician in your midst? No. No. <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> well, you know, and, oh, yeah. He said no, just in case you didn't hear that. <laughs> okay. No, I didn't. I mean, it's, it's one of these people that, on the other hand, that... Uh, after you get to know them a little bit, uh, you might say, God, I, he, I, I wish we had people like that uh, running as candidates, but I never, I, honestly, I never thought that uh, he would be that <laughs> stupid. Um, <laughs> really, because it's, you know, he's, he's, like, he's living in paradise out here, and it's 3,000 miles uh, to Washington, D.C., and um, it's a big price um, um, for someone like Walter. He was giving up um, a big, I would never have asked him to do it, uh, but I was very happy that he did. And it was a tough year. Uh, I ran for re-election in 94, and you know, we lost the majority, we lost Ann Richards, we lost a lot. We being, we Democrats lost a lot that year. So um, he, was, he was flying hard into the wind. Yeah. 
And, and the, the notion of second thoughts, we, we all experienced, there were many second thoughts in our Uncle Doug, my Uncle Doug, who ran his campaign in 96. I mean, it, was a, it, it wasn't, um, I know he gave a good answer to, to Jeff Greenfield when asked that question uh, when he was here covering the race in 1996. And I believe it was a true answer that he wanted to be part of this uh, realization of what our framers envisioned, but it wasn't an easy one. Um, and I was just wondering, Todd or, or Mom, do you have, I mean, you probably have much to say, but just sort of the, the, the seeds that came sort of in the 90s um, or be, maybe before. It was interesting to see Lisa. I didn't know that she would answer so emphatically that she thought he either. always had it in him or, or had it in him for a long time. I would not have expected that answer. Not so. at all. <laughs> Did you? Well, I, I didn't know that, well, it's trying to digest, you know, just hearing her voice for the first time in a long time, but um, I th it, it, her answer reminded me that I think we did have a lot of conversation in our family about his back and forth and, and reluctance and hesitation. And I think, um, you know, I think the impulse made sense. I think that a lot of the themes that were discussed in his courses, and we could talk about this maybe a little bit later, further in the conversation, you know, what is that thread? What is that kernel that ties his vision as an, as an academic, as a scholar, to what he saw as an opportunity um, as a representative in Congress? Um, but I think there was a constant tension there with him um, trying to, to decide if it would work, if it would plug in in an effective way. Um, and then also just kind of the realities of the job, not wondering if he, you know, not sure if he wanted to take that, take on that, that world in that way. I'll offer that um, when he did get there, uh, I came as his spouse, um, but I remember him sitting in the chamber, a house chamber, after votes, where it was all quiet, and he said, he just sat in the chair and just looked up at all the, the, what the broom was and what it stood for and who'd been there. And he exulted that he was there. Not proud, not in a prideful way, but that he could be part of this experiment of democracy. Born in conversation, as you said, Sandro, and he did believe when he said words like building, rebuilding the trust are between people. And he did believe that we do have more in common as human beings than that which divides us. And that came through, I think a lot of it came out of his, the class in Vietnam. There was such a rapport between students and the Vietnam veterans, the healing process that literally took place in this space. It's sacred space. It was then, mm -hmm. when that, those relationships developed. And at the time, he would go, he went a couple times with students back to the wall, uh, the memorial to the Vietnam War after it had been built. And the students would go, and he wanted, some of them wanted to go to see their representative, who, I won't mention names, at that time, it was before his opponent's time, and, and they didn't know where the, the, the member of Congress had kind of gone AWOL. And it, to him, it would reinforce, you've got to take this stuff seriously. It was really a big deal. And he saw it, I believe, back to the original question on public service, he saw it as an extension okay. of his, what he believed to be a calling to the classroom. But he never was content with the classroom, as many of you who were his students knew. He, he, loved, he would love the fact that there are interns out in the community now who are doing this as students, because he would open the windows, he'd open the doors, he, he invited the veterans in to teach. He'd be uncomfortable with two-day seminar on Walter Capps. <laughs> he'd be, cause he'd, and he'd be looking down at his shoes, wouldn't he? <laughs> because he was focused on the stories that needed to be told, that people needed to be able to share. Yeah. 
Well, look, in the event that nobody says it, um, he might have won re-election. I don't know. Um, but the fact that you won 19 terms to the House of Representatives. <laughs> um, no, it, it, nine terms. Nine, nine terms. <laughs> yeah. well, me and me, I'm me. old, but not that old. Yeah, nine terms to the House of Representatives. Is, um, and you can see it now when you're talking. Um, I mean, you did, you, you did a remarkable job, both restoring that trust with the voters of the, it's the 21st, I don't want to get my numbers wrong again, um, um, but with other people in Congress who knew who you were and what you were doing. People trusted you, and it didn't come accidentally. Well, we have Senator Kerry to thank in part for that, because you did come out and teach, co-teach this class, and then, as you explained earlier, um, there was the death of the senior senator in Nebraska, which meant you had a decision to make, and you w entered back into politics, and that led to a presidential run that our dad was happy to join a bit on the campaign trail. But I do think that that's really what lit the match of something that had been uh, apparently brewing, but gave him this real push this kick okay if not I better do this and then the opening as you know there's so much luck that goes into all these things right the fact that there was an open seat in 1994 which makes it much more plausible that someone who'd never run for office before could run for Congress but it really you know I mean I just wonder if you I know you you kind of were uh, kind of a, like coming out, you came out here to teach a class because it was a good time of year to be here, but can you talk a little bit about that time of, of your reflection as someone who was thickened to public service and then took a bit of a reprieve into academic life? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, first of all, it, it's much more likely the road was flowing in the other direction. I mean, I, I um, don't think I can get Walter in trouble today and I don't think I can get myself in trouble today by saying we spend a lot more time talking about things other than his yeah. class. So, um, <laughs> and a lot of it did have to do with national politics and what's going on in the country and what's going on in the world. Uh, you know, you, you don't learn much from an introduction and what you don't know about me is most of the big decisions I've made in my life have been connected to serendipity. Um, you know, I didn't volunteer for the United States Navy SEAL team. I was about to be drafted from the Army, been in the Army. I just read the Kane Mutiny and volunteered for the Navy. And there's many more decisions just like it. I just ran for governor because of you know, four or five fiscal problems. I, I, I served four years and did a press conference one morning without telling anybody and announced I wasn't gonna run again. And then in comes this bunny. That's, the, uh, that's what they call the, the, uh, the kids that went to his high school in uh, Omaha Benson. They were the Benson bunnies. The bunny comes in and says, uh, would you co-teach a class with me uh, in the winter quarter at the University of California, Santa Barbara? So I'm sitting there you know, 43 years old, single, um, and I have, to, I have to decide, do I want to spend January, February, March in Santa Barbara, or January, February, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't like, oh, God, that's great, let's do this class on Vietnam. It, it was a terrific place to go, and uh, I don't think I would have run for Senate had, it, had I not done that, uh, in part because I needed a break, but in part because your dad. The comment says, so it's much more likely, and who can say for certain, it's more, more likely to say that I ran for Senate because of your father, huh. um, uh, rather than he ran for the House because of me. Wow. <laughs> That's life. That's life. <laughs> yeah. That's life. Yeah. I mean, Todd, what about you? Like, do you see what kind of inclinations or not, the lack of inclinations or? Uh, just, um, I think the, that impulse to, to to uh, want to take what he was doing. Um, and and I, I think of, you know, there's a lot of talk about you know, what's sort of the kernel of, of dad. And, being, you know, if you were to, to sort of dig beneath the layers of politics and academics and, and scholarship, um, and we sort of had this exercise in the Common Table Foundation that led to these events, uh, um, trying to define what that kernel is. I think when I was doing some research seven or eight years ago, uh, as we were getting ready to, to put together these, this program of common table events, I found a notepad of his with the phrase, realizing our connectedness. And it was underlined twice. Um, 
and I started, it jumped off the page and I thought, realize is a really interesting word. It can mean recognize, but it, it can also mean the proactive manifest. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's the nugget. And I think he hoped at least that he could create some kind of authentic connection between people that is of value in the same, uh, through the simple process of getting to know each other, telling each other, sharing our stories. Um, and that if, if we could do that in some way that, that could reflect uh, uh, the success of, of, of how that was achieved in his courses on the national stage. And I, I think it, that's also how he saw, to me, the idea of public service uh, was largely for him about in getting people to kind of get to know each other. And I know that that sounds really simple, but I think it, when you look at how that step is so often skipped, you know, we jump right to level 37 or 38, where, to these contentious fringes of a topic where, where it's already, you know, heels are dug in. And, and uh, I, I think he realized that if, if, if we could start at that, that fundamental, um, you know, he was inspired by people, Parker J. Palmer, and um, who, who said, you know, before you debate someone, spend five minutes getting to know their, their story, uh, you, you'll still likely see them as an opponent ideologically, but you will no longer be able to see them as, as an enemy. And so I think that it was those kinds of impulses that drove in a very broad stroke way, his, his desire to, to, to enter that arena, but I don't think it was based on him being, you know, like a policy wonk or anything like that. I think it was a much more general uh, vision. He might yeah. have said, if Terry could do it, I could do it. <laughs> I, I thought, you know, I may have I, set the bar pretty low for him. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, um, having seen him on the, on the campaign trail kind of resist those extremes that as a candidate, the media or the, the folks want you to, to jump towards. I remember him sort of taking, you know, having fun with it, you know, when people say, what's your position on water? You know, oh, I'm for it. We all need water, you know, because yeah. it just kind of the absurdity of right. these yeah, you, you know, you have to be for or against. You have to say yay or nay. You can't. You, the the lack of discourse that you are just is natural as an academic, and then you get buttonholed. Uh, and he just, I think, if anything, if he had a longer tenure, would have made more strides to improve that kind of discourse, not for the entire body mm -hmm. of Congress, but in the interact, at least in the interactions that he had. And I, I, you know, he, I, we can attest, I mean, I was in Washington the, the time that he, the short time that he was there, and he was head over heels happy, yeah. which is, makes me feel good knowing how uh, things ended with such a sudden heart attack that he wasn't stressed or unhappy or unhealthy. He was, he was kind of, you know, he was riding high. And I do have this memory I wanted to share of, um, of the State of the Union that year that he passed. Um, I was just in a wonderful position of having helped President Clinton with that speech amongst, you know, a team of 15 or so. But having worked on that speech in the gallery, and you're up there in the, yeah. with the other, yeah, with the other partners, and I'm there with the, with the speech writing staff, and he was there as the new member of Congress, and he just, I mean, he was just... Seventh heaven. Seventh heaven. Seventh heaven. You know, the, Thank you. That's Thank a. You. That's a. Maybe that's an appropriate uh, point being made here. <laughs> you are welcome here. You're welcome, and you are welcome here. It'd be great if he could wait and let us finish the conversation first, though. Yeah, have, that would be helpful. As we were talking about polarization. No, unfortunately, and, they yeah. have the they have the power to shut this event down, and I think that's what they intend to do. Is that what you want us to do? Leave the stage. We demand that you. The only. The, we, we, we don't have the power to, what well, we have the power to, you, no, you have the power to drive us on the stage. Do you want us to leave the stage? Can you speak to the Santa Barbara Do you want us to leave the stage? No, the, you know that this, 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 
Actually, I would be intimate to be there. That's not what this conference is about. If you wanted to make it about, you're going to end the conference. It, you have to answer the question. Do you want? I think we should leave. We're hoping to. We're hoping to continue the conversation. Thanks for your message. I under, I received it, and we're we're hoping to continue the conversation if you allow us to do that. Message received, thank you. And we're, we're talking a lot about kind of getting beyond these. Labels. I'm totally happy to talk to all of you people. I'm not yeah. a politician, but I'm happy to talk to you. It's just, we can't have this conversation if you're gonna keep interrupting. Show some courtesy to Walter's memory. They, they are not in public office anymore. We're talking about a person It's not on the supervisoral okay. agenda, I don't think. <laughs> no. Anyway, okay, we're All good, right. let's... Bob, you have experience with this. <laughs> no, I think the, my experience is if, if they, they are free to continue this, and if they continue this, the conference is over. And they have to accept responsibility for having shut the conference down. And if, if you want to shut, you have the power to do it. And we, you've made your statement, we've taken it on board, but if you keep interrupting, the conference is over, and you are responsible for shutting it down. Thank you, Senator Kerry. If I might address the students briefly, I'm Greg Johnson, director of the Walter H. Capp Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Life, and we're hosting this event. Uh, we welcome your presence, and you should know that my sympathies, my, the questions I would ask are probably quite similar to the questions you're asking right now. But this forum is about someone who convened even this kind of conversation for years on this campus. Some of the hardest questions ever asked on this campus about Vietnam War, about death, about collective responsibility. That's the man we're honoring right now in this space. And just today, I had a conversation with Chancellor Yang about how do we address the pressing issue you've brought forward. And it's unfolding that we're setting out ideas for how to have this conversation in a principled, public, and direct way. And we really welcome you to that. You can find me so easily. I'll come out and meet you in the foyer. We can talk about your involvement in that process. We'd love to have you involved. And again, you probably have no idea how close my sympathies are to yours. I just am asking that right now you respect this space where a man's memory and his family's legacy is being honored in a way uh, he convened these very conversations over blood, over death, primarily focused on the Vietnam War, but that was his legacy, and that's what we're celebrating today. I do not want you to stand here now. So I'm inviting you to join me in the foyer, and we can talk about when we're going to convene the conversation soon that would include you in a public forum, and I mean that honestly, and I'm happy to meet you right now and back if you'd join me. Can we, how about turning on the house lights so we can at least see who we're talking to? Dale? We can music? see Dale again. There we go. No, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, in the light. Being in the light is important. You all who have come, may we just say, may I say, thank you for the memories that you evoked. Thank you for the gift 
that you have given me. Thank you for the gift you've given Walter's family. But more important, thank you for your willingness to continue the important conversations that to make democracy. Democracy is born in conversation. And that's what this is about. All of it. Right. All of it. Thank you. Thank you so much.